victory over the Big Mac and Wendy single for best taste, Burger King presents our first television coupon. Good for a free Whopper this weekend only. All you do is buy one Whopper and say... The Whopper beat the Big Mac. Just say that and get your second Whopper free. Whopper beat the Big Mac. That's right, for best taste. The Whopper beat the Big Mac. Buy a Whopper, get one free at Burger King this weekend only. Just say... The Whopper beat the Big Mac. I want one of them Big Macs. I'm having a Big Mac attack. Is this show going to make me hungry? Well, it could. And that's a Whopper, not a Big Mac. Oh. What time is it? It's Pod Blast Time! That's right, it's Pod Blast time once again. How are ya? How are ya? How are ya? This is your weird, informative, and hopefully fun time capsule of memories of days gone by as we forge ahead together in the game of life. Specifically, pop culture history, and life experiences that we all have in common. That's what the Nostalgic Pod Blast is all about. This is the Nostalgia Show with a bite. Because it bites. <laughs> Whoa. I'm your host, Chance Bartels. No relation to Chance the Rapper, as you can see. But as always, we've got a good one for you today as Steve Harvey would say at the beginning of Family Feud. Today, we're going to talk about actress Elizabeth Shue, who recently turned 60 years of age. I think she's up there with Tom Cruise. I think she's a tad underrated. She's mega talented and has a lot of iconic roles under her belt that we'll talk about and a lot of commercial work, like the Burger King spot you heard at the very start of tonight's show. Also, I have our regular features for you like the old-fashioned expression of the week, the classic music video of the week, the TV cliche of the week, the fake rant of the week, the nostalgic treat of the week, and the nostalgic toy of the week, and a fun trivia game that's interactive. There's fun jingles, interviews with Elizabeth Shue and others that we'll talk about today, and many other nostalgic items for your ears and eyes. If you're listening at Fistful of Radio out of Atlanta or on Apple or Google or Podbean or Spotify, I'd encourage you to go to our YouTube channel, The Nostalgic, with a C, Nostalgic, not Nostalgia, The Nostalgic Pod Blast, and see what we have going on. Um, and also there's video in our Facebook group, the Nostalgic Pod Blast, which is approaching 6,000 members, and I'm grateful for each and every member, except for the spam bots, and I know there's some in there that are just spammers. Also, there's going to be a little Loki Season 2 talk at the very start of this edition of the Nostalgic Pod Blast. I'll get to in just a moment. If you want to call in, which is very unlikely, I'm live past midnight Saturday morning, technically, but if you're up and you want to call in to talk about your favorite Elizabeth Shue movies, Loki Season 2, or anything else nostalgic, the number is 770-438-1050, or simply leave a comment right here in the comment chat section with your thoughts. But let's begin with this. Loki Season 2 began on Disney Plus recently in October 2023. And it's pretty good, but it's off to a very confusing start. 
as did WandaVision, the very first MCU Marvel streaming series on Disney Plus, but then it all made sense at the end. I'm confident that'll be the case with Loki season two. But also, they made a slight error, not a huge error, but a mistake in terms of history. At the end of season two, episode one, that's not a spoiler if you haven't seen it. So don't worry, this is not a spoiler. Let's get into that right now. Okay, there's a scene during the end credits of Loki season two, episode one, that's set in the year 1982. And a main character that I won't reveal who is who it is, uh, this main character visits a McDonald's in the year 1982. The mistake has something to do with the set dressing and the props on the set of the 1982 McDonald's. The mistake was that there were no ashtrays on any of the tables. In fact, I shot a video that I still have back in March of 1988 at Perimeter Mall here in the Atlanta, Georgia area, where you see these McDonald's ashtrays on every single table in that particular McDonald's back in 88, which at that time was located inside of a shopping mall that I mentioned, Perimeter Mall. So that's a minor, minor gripe. I mean, but there was not one ashtray in that shot of the 1982 McDonald's. And also they mentioned Chicken McNuggets. You know, I meant to research that. I'll research it as I play a clip. I don't think those hit until 1983, but I could be wrong. I don't know. But other than that, I thought it was a pretty interesting episode. And, of course, Short Round is in it. Is that a spoiler? I'm sure everyone knows by now. The Oscar-winning actor who originally was in The Goonies in the 80s, who's had a major comeback, is in this show. And I was delighted to see him when I could understand him. (laughs) But back to the video that I shot at Perimeter Mall in March of 1988. As I said, in that video, I was 17, and my friends and I are messing with people in the mall. It's really funny. And I may upload that video to YouTube because here's some insider information. I now have an additional customized supercomputer that has a disk drive. I had one before years ago that crashed. And so I just got MacBooks and laptops that did not have a disk drive. But now, once again, I can upload rare and personal video content from my library to the Internet, which I'll begin doing by the end of 2023. And I'm going to take this show to another level. I have video clips for the watcher on YouTube or Facebook Live. I'm very excited to start doing You know, I tried to keep this as like a camcorder. I wanted this to be a one camera operation for the watcher where it looks like it's shot on a VHS camcorder, like a JVC camcorder from the 80s. That was by design for the nostalgic vibe. But, you know, I got to keep up. Got to keep up with the others on YouTube that are in 4K and HD. And, you know, I, I, I need to have some video content. And hell, I've got such an immense library of video content, exclusive stuff that you can't find anywhere else that I want to share. But uh, quickly, I want to explain, and we'll get to the nostalgia, that I used to have a YouTube channel, and it was called Films or Real, that had millions of views. No credit to me, because it was stuff I was sharing. It wasn't like I was doing a show like I do now. It was the stuff I have that I shared. And what happened was, you know, I, I certainly don't own this material, so I got hit. I got hit, and you won't believe what caused the end to the films are real, and that's film. It doesn't matter because you can't pull it up. It's gone. It got disbanded in 2009, but I had millions of views, and uh, it was called Films Are Real, Films, letter R, R E E L, like a film reel, Um, which the E Network caused to be taken down because I'd uploaded the E True Hollywood Story of Red Fox, and... uh, you know, that was the straw that broke the camel's back. This was, like I said, it was in 2009. But before that, a company called D.L. Tafner, the people that own Three's Company, they were not happy I'd shared an episode of The Ropers on my channel, like the whole episode. But they were cool and worked with me, actually. I said, look, you know, I won't do this again and blah, blah, blah. Anyway, I won't go into the details. No one cares. But E was a bit more rigid. Now, they gave me a break. But they said, remove our content, and I thought I did, and I accidentally left one of their E! True Hollywood stories up, and they thought I lied. And so they complained to YouTube, and that was the end of my channel. 
and that was the nail in that channel's coffin. I'd spent thousands of hours of work put into that, and now it's just in limbo somewhere in the servers at YouTube. Anyway, let's get back to the nostalgia fun here on the Nostalgic Pod Blast, and I'm going to get back to uploading things that I don't think will be an issue for my 16 millimeter film collection. I have a lot of cool commercials, like with Cheryl Teagues. Cheryl Teagues, the model, uh, doing an ultra-bright commercial in 1967. And a lot of character actors that later made it big that did commercial work in the 60s and 50s. I have exclusive stuff that I'm not seeing on YouTube from anyone else. So anyway, I'll share it on the Nostalgic Pod Blast channel or on my other channel, Chance Acting Demo, which has more subscribers in YouTube land. But anyways, for the listener, I'm sorry. I just I digressed, but I think it's important because I'm excited. I'm going to take the show to another level very soon in 2023 and 2024. So item... Iconic film actress Elizabeth Shue turned 60 years of age back on Friday, October 6th, 2023. I normally would save that for our birthday segment, but I, I want to do a little bit of a mini biography on Elizabeth Shue. Now, here's some background on Elizabeth, and she spells her name with an S. It's E-L-I-S-A-B-E-T-H. I think that's cool instead of a Z. Anyway, uh, Elizabeth Judson Shu was born on Sunday, October 6th, 1963. And of course, she's best known for her roles in the films Karate Kid in 1984, Adventures in Babysitting. I have a funny clip where she says, you know what she says. It's her line. And I have the censored version of it. I won't go into it now, but you know the line. Don't F with the babysitter. She did Cocktail with Tom Cruise in 1988. And then she joined the cast of Back to the Future with the first sequel, Back to the Future Part 2, in 1989. And then she was in Back to the Future Part 3, the final part of the trilogy in 1990. She was in Soap Dish in 1991. And a movie I really like a lot, The Saint, in 1997, based on the Roger Moore television series, starring Val Kilmer and Elizabeth Shue. I love that movie. She was in Hollow Man in 2000. I've talked about that before. Uh, with Kevin Bacon as the Invisible Man gone nuts. It's a great thriller. Another kind of underrated movie. I saw that in the theater several times. I just thought it was great fun. Uh, good revenge flick. Um, and then uh, Piranha 3D. Another movie that people trash from 2010. Have that in the background too in 3D Blu-ray. Man, I love that movie. And God, so many great actors were in it in cameos. And it's got laughs, it's got gore, it's got everything you'd want. It's like It was like a revival of the 1980s slasher film. And it was like Piranha from the 1970s, you know, hence Piranha 3D. It was great. And uh, Greg Nicotero did the effects from The Walking Dead, whom I worked with in The Walking Dead. And now he's a big-time director of The Walking Dead and its spinoffs. Um but he started the business in Day of the Dead in 1985, and uh, he is just an effects madman in a good way. But getting back to Elizabeth Shue, she did a movie, Battle of the Sexes, in 2017, Death Wish in 2018, Greyhound in 2020. But for her performance in Leaving Las Vegas in 1995, she was nominated for an Academy Award for Best Actress, as well as the Golden Globe, the Screen Actors Guild Award, the BAFTA Award. On television, she did a lot of commercials. We're going to play some of her Burger King spots and other spots in a moment. She starred as Ju Julie Finlay in the CBS Forensics Crime Drama Thriller CSI Crime Scene Investigation from 2012 to 2015. And she was in The Boys on Prime as Madeline Stilwell. And The Boys presents Diabolical. And she reprised her Karate Kid role in the third season of Cobra Kai on Netflix. And she currently stars as Anne in the Netflix dramedy On the Verge. But uh, just some of her backgrounds. She was born in Wilmington, Delaware, as I said, back on Sunday, October 6th, 1963. She's the daughter of Anne Brewster and James William Shue. A one-time congressional candidate, lawyer, and real estate developer who was president of the International Food and Beverage Corporation. Her mother was a vice president 
in private in the private banking division of the Chemical Bank Corporation. But she grew up in South Orange, New Jersey. Her parents divorced when she was nine. Shu's mother is a descendant of pilgrim leader William Brewster, while her father's family emigrated from Germany to Pennsylvania in the early 19th century. Elizabeth Shue was raised by her three brothers, William, Andrew, and John. You may remember Andrew from Melrose Place, uh, an Aaron Spelling spinoff of Beverly Hills 90210. And she was very close to all of those brothers. Her younger brother, Andrew, like I said, was uh, best known to many as playing Billy Campbell. That was the character he played in Melrose Place on Fox. Um, Elizabeth Shue graduated from Columbia High School in 1981 in Maplewood, New Jersey, where she and Andrew were inducted into the school's Hall of Fame in 1994. She has two half-siblings from her father's remarriage, Jenna and Harvey Shue. After graduating from high school, Elizabeth Shue attended Wellesley College, that's in Massachusetts, and then transferred to Harvard University in 1985, from which she withdrew to pursue her acting career. She was inspired by a friend to work in television commercials as a way to pay for college, and boy, was she successful. She had a lot of big spots. We'll talk about that later. And she was just one semester short of earning her degree. Over a decade later, in 2000, she returned to Harvard and completed her B.A. in political science. Now, in the uh, 1980s and early 1990s, during her studies at Columbia High School and after her parents' divorce, she began acting in these television commercials, becoming a common sight in advertisements for Burger King. I already played one at the very beginning of the show, but I want to play another one for you. A couple of them. And she did one, actually, with some other stars and future stars. We'll talk about that in a sec. Let's see here. Where are you, my little friend? Okay, here we go. Here's a 1982 commercial with, with Elizabeth Shue for Burger King. A very important message from Burger King. At this time... We'd like to offer our sympathy to McDonald's and Wendy's. You see, the Whopper beat the Big Mac for best taste overall among consumers of both burgers. In a similar test, we beat Wendy's single. Now, that may have surprised McDonald's and Wendy's. Well, so we just wanted to say, it's okay, guys. Winning isn't everything, but it sure is fun. Aren't you hungry for Burger King now? Here's another one. Presenting the Burger King meal combo. You get a Whopper large fries. Don't wait, there's more. And a Coke medium size. Meal combo, what a deal. Or a bacon double cheese. Large fries, medium Coke. Can I have a meal combo? Please. I'm getting very hungry. Come get all this good food. Aha, uh -huh. you'll pay less than you would. Great fries. What, what a deal. And I'm going to play yet another one. And then I have one. Well, let's see. Where is this one? Here's a 1982 Christmas commercial with Sarah Michelle Geller and Leah Thompson. Message of all from... Here we go. Now the most important message of all from Burger King. Have Now, I had this one for you, too. No, let me, I want to go in chronological order, just a second. Question. This is with uh, another 1980s movie star from the John Hughes movies and Andrew McCarthy. Here's Elizabeth Shue with Andrew McCarthy in 1983 making a special announcement for Burger King. Enjoy the show. And now, an announcement that can't wait. We have something to tell you. We can't keep it a secret any longer. See, from the very beginning, I knew he was a winner. I felt the same way. 
So now it's time for everybody in the world to know. Burger King has switched to Pepsi. Burger King and Pepsi. Two winning tastes. Together at last? Together at last. <laughs> Do you remember that when they switched to Pepsi? I have some glasses, like movie tie-ins and stuff. Um, now here is another one I do want to play, and then we'll get to some other information. Now, a friendly wager from Burger King. Stop what you're doing and go to your phone. I want to make a bet with you. In a coast to coast survey, three out of four people said they like their burgers fixed their way. That's how we do it at Burger King. Now here's the bet. Pick up your phone and call any four people. I'll bet at least three will choose. Have it your way, like it's Burger King. Any takers? Aren't you hungry for Burger King now? Last one from 1984. So she was a pitch woman for Burger King from 1982 to 1984, and I think into 1985, and as well as many other commercial spots we'll talk about in a second. Let's listen to the very last spot I pulled for you tonight of Elizabeth Shue endorsing Burger King and acting in Burger King's Burger spots. King would like to ask you a very important, very... Let me back it up. Burger King would like to ask you a very important, very crucial question. But relax. It's also very easy. If you think flame broiling is the best way to make a tender, juicy, tasty steak, what do you think is the best way to make a tender, juicy, tasty hamburger? Think about it. Now here's another question. If McDonald's and Wendy's fry and Burger King flame broil... Aren't you hungry for Burger King now? What a dated jingle, huh? Um, let's see here. So, Elizabeth also did TV spots, or ads, if you will, for De Beers Diamonds, Chewels Bubblegum in 1981. I'll play that in a second. Honeywell Computers in 1982. I had pulled that, but I won't play it because it's pretty visual. Um, and Best Foods, Hellman's Mayonnaise, Stovetop Stuffing, Johnson & Johnson, a 1987 ad campaign uh, where she just had just given birth to a baby. Um, and all sorts of stuff. Let me play another bit of commercials, not Burger King. And then I have some movie clips that I want to talk about and play for you that Elizabeth did. Let's see, where is this? Here we go. All right, now, she was also a gymnast, and she's playing a character in this commercial I'm going to play, and she has been, she's twirling around, and she does a flip in the air. Let's listen to this commercial re really quickly. Why did gymnast Jenny Barr stop chewing carefree and start chewing new and improved Chewels sugarless gum? Chewels taste better. Why did Chef Guy LaRue stop and start chewing Chewels? So Chewels, it tastes better. Why did the Hoboken Halftones stop and start chewing Chewels? Chewels taste better. New and improved Chewels is the only sugarless gum with a delicious flavor center. And taste tests prove of leading sugarless gums. Chewels taste better. To an entering freshman, higher education can seem highly confusing. But at Smith College, a Honeywell computer has things under control. A Honeywell computer handles registration, class assignments, and sets maintenance schedules. Honeywell even considers personal interests before assigning roommates. Honeywell, you should see what you do with computers. I meant to skip that one. There's something you don't know about Atari video games. Are you kidding? He knows everything. Everything? He's the best at berserk. Ten Space Miller Star Raiders, and he scores at least a million in Defender. At least. But do you know you can get an Atari video game cartridge free? Buy two of these great hits, and Atari will send you any one of these great games free. He didn't know that. Yes, I did. No, you didn't. Yes, I did. No, you didn't. No, I didn't. Buy two now. Get one free. The Stridex sweeps you clean and clearer looking skin. The proof is on the pad. And so is the prize in the Stridex Prizes on the Pad sweepstakes. Everyone's an instant winner. From a 25 cent coupon up to a $10,000 grand prize. A $5,000 cash plus a Panasonic VCR, video camera, color TV monitor, and more. Hundreds of second and third prizes, too. Just scratch the pad on the game card to see which prize you've won. So get the proof. Get the prize. Get Stridex.
that's a lot of products. Um, <laughs> those are big accounts too. Those are big contracts. Let's see what else I have. We'll talk about her television, her early television work, not commercial televisions, television work, but acting work in television. <sighs> Elizabeth Shue had small parts credited as Lisa Shue in The Royal Romance of Charles and Diana in 1982 and in Somewhere Tomorrow in 1983, which provide an early starring role for Sarah Jessica Parker as well. Shue made her feature film debut in 1984 when she co-starred opposite Ralph Macchio in The Karate Kid as Allie. Now, I remember Ralph Macchio before that in Eight is Enough. He was the troubled uh, cousin of Abby, Jeremy, in the final scene. He was like the cousin Oliver in the Brady Bunch of Eight is Enough. And actually, the network had screwed with the time slot. It, that's why the ratings went down for Eight is Enough. And it finally went off the air in 1981 at the end of the 1980-1981 television season. But anyway, after Eight is Enough went away, of course, Ralph Macchio starred in the series of Karate Kid movies, as did Elizabeth Shue as Allie, a high school cheerleader and the love interest of Ralph's main character. And she was a series regular as the teenage daughter of a military family in the short-lived television series titled Call to Glory between 1984 and 1985, which she followed in 1986, starring alongside Terrence Stamp. You know who that is? He was General Zod in the Superman movie, Superman the Movie, and Superman 2. Kneel before Zod! 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 But <laughs> in 1986, Elizabeth Shue acted with him in the British horror film titled Link. L-I-N-K, Link. In 1987... Elizabeth Shue appeared in the television movie Double Switch, which was part of the Disney Sunday movie series. Co-starring with George Newbern, who would go on to support her in her first star vehicle, the hugely popular Adventures in Babysitting in the same year, 1987. But in 1988... Elizabeth Shue starred in Cocktail as the love interest of Tom Cruise's lead character. I'm going to play some of the trailer, if not the entire trailer, just a couple of minutes of Cocktail, because that was an awesome movie, and she looked terrific in that movie. And I think I have that for you right here. Let's see. And by the way, I was never infatuated with Elizabeth Shue like I was some of the other actresses. She reminded me like she was cute, you know. She reminded me of like a sister. Now she did resemble uh, people I knew in real life that I was attracted to, but I just liked her for her talent. Honestly, I never had a crush on her, but I do uh, like her and respect her for her iconic roles. Let's listen to the trailer from 1988 for Cocktail with Tom Cruise and Elizabeth Shue. In one square mile of this saloon lies the greatest concentration of wealth in the world. Yes. But how was a bartender going to get his hands on any of it? This is the big time. Are you ready for the big time young Mr. Flanagan? I think I can handle it. This isn't what I ordered. Hey, don't get your act together. A white wine. All right. Now, what was it that you ordered? A martini. What's in that? In many ways, the fool a customer. You will learn them all. Yes, Obi-Wan. You get the women, you get the bucks, and you can see the color of their panties, and you know you've got talent. Stick with me, son, I'll make you a star. I want you guys working for me. This is a real opportunity. Jet set bar, then, right? The Caribbean, Jamaica, man. Can I buy a drink? My rum specialties, perhaps? Bartender with the line for everything. The bartender. Now, he's about to be swept off his feet. Stay here forever. By the one thing he didn't expect. I don't tell me Brian Flanagan is in love. This lady's gonna do a number on you, mate. This is more than just a one-night stand. You made a move on her? I'm your friend, you dumbass! Well, I don't have any friends! As of now, that is for sure! Your sexy little smile's not gonna work this time. What the hell is this? That's for you. $10,000. Is that all your daughter's worth? You think I'm letting some bartender walk into my family? I love you. I want to marry you. Throw this bum out of here! You're so hung up on money. See this? Jordan? 
This is how hung up on money I am. And as for the way I feel about you, I need you to know. Tom Cruise. Cocktail. What a great movie. I just love that film. I'll watch it anytime I see it streaming or on television if I can, if I have time. The following year, Elizabeth Shue starred in the short film Body Wars, which was used at Epcot in an Atlas simulator attraction in the world in the Wonders of Life Pavilion until 2007 at Walt Disney World Orlando. Other roles followed, including appearing as Jennifer Parker in Back to the Future Part 2 in 1989 and Back to the Future Part 3 in 1990. They were shot at the same time, which is why at the end of Back to the Future Part 2, they had a nice little trailer for Part 3, which was set in the Old West in the 1800s. Um, and she replaced Claudia Wells as uh, Marty McFly's girlfriend in the, from the first film. And she declined Claudia Wells uh, to reprise her role in Back to the Future because of a family illness. Also, actor Crispin Glover from the first film Back to the Future was replaced as Marty McFly's dad, George McFly. The writer of Back to the Future has claimed his name's Gail, G-A-L-E. He claimed that because Glover was not a huge fan of Back to the Future Part Two script, he demanded he be paid $1 million to appear in the movie. As producers did not wish to meet this demand, actor Jeffrey Wiseman was brought in to replace Crispin Glover. And hell, in the first movie, Marty McFly himself was not portrayed by Michael J. Fox, but the role was played by Eric Stoltz. And Stoltz had previously starred in Fast Times at Ridgemont High and another movie, Running Hot. He hadn't done Mask yet with Cher. <clears throat> that was the year after, uh, the same year actually that Back to the Future was released in 1985, where he had the heavy prosthetic head and face. Um, but Eric Stoltz was eventually let go just one month into filming the first Back to the Future movie because director Robert Zemeckis and the writer Bob Gale felt the line reading by Eric Stoltz and the line delivery was just too intense. But getting back to uh, Claudia Wells, who played Marty's girlfriend, played by, of course, Michael J. Fox. Her mother was diagnosed with cancer, so Claudia Wells put her career on hold for family reasons and told Universal Pictures she would be unavailable to reprise her Back to the Future role for the two sequels. And that's where Elizabeth Shue replaced her, who also suffered a family tragedy. It was around this time that Elizabeth Shue's older brother, William, died in an accident on a family holiday, family vacation. Although her career was on the rise with her playing lead roles, Elizabeth Shue elected to take on the smaller supporting role of Jennifer in these sequels to Back to the Future to allow her to deal with her family loss. The sequels were filmed back to back, and she was featured prominently in Back to the Future Part 2, appearing in bookend pieces in the third part of the trilogy. Yeah, because she was a major force in Cocktail. So I guess it would be considered a step back in terms of the screen time, but that's an iconic role in iconic series Back to the Future. Um, and she also auditioned for um, Say Anything in 1989, being a runner-up along with Jennifer Connelly. In May 1990, Elizabeth Shue made her Broadway debut in Some American Abroad at the Lincoln Center. The following year, Elizabeth Shue returned to cinema, where she appeared in the comedies The Marrying Man with Kim Basinger and Alec Baldwin, and Soap Dish with Sally Field, Robert Downey Jr., Kevin Kline, Kathy Moriarty, and Whoopi Goldberg. Yeah! yeah, yeah, yeah. Between 1992 and 1994, Elizabeth Shue appeared in a variety of supporting roles in both film and television. These included the comedy 20 Bucks, reuniting her with Christopher Lloyd from Back to the Future 
as the crazy but genius Doc Brown. And she was in the noir thriller titled The Underneath. And a guest appearance in Dream On. And the romantic comedy Heart and Souls reuniting with Robert Downey Jr. And she also returned to Broadway in 1993 over 30 years ago. Performing in Tina Howe's production of Birth and Afterbirth. Now in the 1990s. Although she was often cast as a girl next door type, in a career defining role, she starred as a prostitute in the 1995 film Leaving Las Vegas with Nicolas Cage. The role earned her, as I mentioned before, an Academy Award nomination for Best Actress. She was nominated for a BAFTA Golden Globe and Screen Actors Guild Award for Best Actress, and she won Best Actress at the Independent Spirit Awards. Los Angeles Film Critics Association Awards, and the National Society of Film Critics Awards. Her career flourished after her Oscar nomination, landing her diverse roles. She starred in The Trigger Effect in 1996, as well as Woody Allen's Deconstructing Harry, also in 1996, which showcased her comedic abilities amongst heavyweight co-stars Billy Crystal, Demi Moore, Robin Williams, and Stanley Tucci. Elizabeth Shue also displayed some action movie skills in the 1997 spy remake we talked about, The Saint, opposite Val Kilmer. Love that movie. The thriller Palmetto in 1998 afforded her the chance to play a film noirish femme fatale role opposite Woody Harrelson. And she co starred in Cousin Betty in 1998 with Jessica Lang, who just announced her retirement from acting. And Paul Verhoeven's Hollow Man in 2000, got it right there in the background, the DVD of it, with Kevin Bacon, which proved another summer blockbuster. Yeah, that movie did well. I didn't pull the numbers. I should have. But um, she was fantastic in that movie. It was an Invisible Man thriller. In 1999, Elizabeth Shue starred as Molly a young autistic woman placed into the care of her unwilling bachelor brother, played by Aaron Eckhart. She played a mother that reveals her dark past to her teenage daughter in the 2001 ABC movie, Oprah Winfrey Presents Amy and Isabel. She has since stated that she was, quote, extremely proud of that film, which no one ever saw. So it's a good lesson that if you do work for yourself, and not necessarily for the end result, unquote. Shoe starred in Leo in 2002, and Dennis Hopper in Mysterious Skin in 2004, opposite Joseph Gordon-Levitt in Hide and Seek in 2005, opposite Robert De Niro in Dakota Fanning, and in Dreamer in 2005, again opposite Dakota Fanning and Kurt Russell. In 2007, Elizabeth Shue and her two brothers, Andrew Shue and John Shue, produced Gracie. Her husband, Davis Gungenheim, also produced and directed. She played the mother of a main character who was loosely based in her own experiences as the only girl on a boy's soccer team. Andrew also appeared as the soccer coach and her previous co-star from The Trigger Effect, Dermot Mulroney. Played the father of the main character. I'm messing up. Someone's texting me and it's throwing me off. Andrew Shu initially conceived of it as a story about their late brother, William, the oldest Shu sibling, who was the captain of the high school soccer team. He died in a freak accident while the family was on vacation in 1988. The older brother character of Johnny was based on Will. She also starred in... In the little scene movie First Born in 2007 with British actor Stephen McIntosh. Almost done, folks. In 2008, Elizabeth Shue starred in Hamlet 2 as a fictionalized version of herself. In the film, she has to quit acting to become a nurse and is the favorite actress of Dana Marsh, Steve Coogan. In 2009, Elizabeth Shue on the seventh season of HBO's Curb Your Enthusiasm. She appeared on Curb Your Enthusiasm as an actress competing with Cheryl Hines' character for the part of George's ex-wife, 
for the Seinfeld reunion. In 2009, she starred alongside Thomas Hayden Church in Don McKay. But in 2010, Elizabeth Shue starred in Piranha 3D as Sheriff Julie Forrester. I love that movie. I want to show that for the camera. I'll, I'll wait till I play a clip. Um, the, the case is, excuse me, the Blu-ray case is really cool. I like the design. And it's literally a 3D case. Somebody's just texting me like crazy and it's throwing me off. Jesus friggin' Christ, stop it. Anyway, they don't know that I'm on the air. Um, let's see here. In addition, Elizabeth Shue played the former groupie mother of Abigail Breslin and Janie Jones and a psychologist in Waking Madison alongside Sari. It doesn't matter. <laughs> People we've never heard of. Sarah Romer and Emma Joan Poots. I kid you not. P-O-O-T-S. In 2012, Elizabeth Shue appeared in three wide-release theatrical films. The thriller The House at the End of the Street with Jennifer Lawrence. We have heard of her. And Curtis Hansen's Chasing Mavericks opposite Gerard Butler. And David Frankel's Hope Springs as Karen the bartender in a cameo scene with Meryl Streep. The year 2012 also marked Elizabeth Shue's return to television in a series regular role when she joined the cast of season 12's CSI crime scene investigation as Julie Finlay opposite Ted Danson and rep replacing Marge Hallenberger, who was a soap opera star in the 80s and 90s long before CSI. Finlay is the newest CSI who just finished anger management classes. She continued in the role until the end of season 15, where her character's fate was left hanging in the balance. Later revealed in the two-part 2015 TV movie wrap-up finale of the entire series to have died. But Elizabeth Shue did not appear in the episode. During her time in the series... Being a massive tennis fan, as well as a regular tennis player, she jokingly suggested to the producers that they have an episode centered around a murder at a tennis tournament. In season 13, her wish was granted, and her friends and former pros turned commentators. 18-time Grand Slam champion Chris Everett, three-time Grand Slam winner Lindsay Davenport, and two-time mixed doubles slam champ Justin appeared in an episode as themselves. She also reunited with Back to the Future alumna, Leah Thompson, whom she'd acted with for the first time in a Burger King commercial that we played, a Christmas ad, um, who guest starred in an episode of season 14 of NCIS. In 2014, Elizabeth Shue appeared as a cougar in Behaving Badly, along with Selena Gomez, Nat Wolf, and Heather Graham. I love Heather Graham. Former roller girl in Boogie Nights, and uh, she was in the Lost in Space movie as Judy Robinson and many other roles. Of course, she got her big break in the American Woman music video by Lenny Kravitz, the remake of the uh, the song by the Guess Who. In 2015, Elizabeth Shue had guest starred in an episode of the Patrick Stewart series Blunt Talk. In 2017, she provided a strong supporting role in Battle of the Sexes opposite Steve Carell and Emma Stone. She had originally signed on as a tennis advisor for the film, which recounts the 1973 showdown between female player Billie Jean King and former men's champ Bobby Riggs. In 2018, Elizabeth Shue co-starred in Eli Roth's remake of Death Wish opposite Bruce Willis. God bless Bruce Willis. He's going through a lot of struggles, as everybody knows right now in 2023. But she played his ill-fated wife. And Death Wish, the remake of the Charles Bronson movies. Those are terrible movies. What happens? You know, rapes, murders, uh, horrible. Terrible things that unfortunately happen in real life. And crime is just rampant here in 2023. It's, it's awful. Anyway, in the movie, she was also reunited with Vincent, who had appeared in Adventure, Adventures in Babysitting with her years before in 1987, filmed in 1986. In 2019, Elizabeth Shue took a leading role in the American superhero drama television series The Boys on Prime with Carl Urban and Jack Quaid and will be playing the lead role in the TNT television pilot Constance 
playing a corrupt former beauty queen. In the latter, she will also be one of the executive producers, along with Robert Downey Jr., whom she'd previously co-starred with in Soap Dish and Heart and Souls, we just talked about, and his wife, Susan Downey, among others. Constance is not going forward to series, so it remains to be seen if the pilot will air as a television movie. Elizabeth Shue starred in Greyhound opposite Tom Hanks, released in 2020. In the same year, Elizabeth Shue reprised her Karate Kid role as Allie Mills for a guest appearance in the sequel, Cobra Kai, alongside her original co-stars, Ralph Macchio and William Zabka. In terms of her personal life, Elizabeth Shue married film director Davis Guggenheim, Guggenheim in 1994, and the couple have three children. Now, um, this is a little factoid for the Marvel geeks out there. This is a bit of a stretch, but I think the first live-action Thor appearance in terms of someone portraying the Norse god of thunder and the Marvel character was in Adventures in Babysitting. With that kid with called himself Thor with the Thor hat. I know it's a stretch. It was just a kid, but that was based on the Marvel comic Thor. And Adventures in Babysitting was released on July 3rd, 1987 for the 4th of July weekend by Touchtone Pictures and Buena Vista Pictures, a division of Disney, of course, Disney, earning 34.4 million box office bucks. I'm going to say a bad word here. The catchphrase that Elizabeth Shue had, <laughs> here's a bad word warning, and I'm going to play the clip of it. And Adventures of Babysitting, of course, is don't fuck with the babysitter. Let's listen to that clip now. And the censored version, and that's something I want to talk about on the show later in a future pod blast, and play some clips of some censored scenes like from National Lampoon's Vacation, for instance. Um... A censored version of, like, the tirade of, uh, hang on, let me, let me get this queued up one second. Is it going? Nope, it's not. Hang on a second, folks. I had it queued right up. That's what happens, that's what happens when I get distracted. A friend of mine was trying to text me, a guy friend. He didn't mean any harm, but he he, he, he fucked everything up. Is what he did. God damn. Excuse my language. I'm a I'm a Christian. All right. Um. Got to check my mark. Okay. Here's the line. Don't. I wish I could edit. Doing this live is a bear sometimes. Don't fuck with the lords of hell. Yeah. Babysitter. <laughs> now here's the censored version. Same scene. Don't fool with the Lords of Hell. Don't fool with the babysitter. <laughs> Doesn't have the same impact, does it? So that just cracks me up. But um about that Thor business. I know that's a stretch, and some of you are saying, oh, bullshit. That's not the first live-action appearance of Thor. Hey, man, Thor is a frog in the Loki streaming show season one and in the comic books starting, I think, in 1984-85. So if Thor can be a frog, it, Thor can be a kid. Whoever is worthy holds the hammer and has the power of Thor, as we've seen in the movie. So, okay, I'll, I know it's a stretch, but I'm going to defend my assertion that that was the first time you saw Thor in a live-action, non-cartoon version. But Thor next appeared very soon after the release of Adventures in Babysitting in The Incredible Hulk Returns on NBC, which aired on Sunday, May 22, 1988, as a television movie of the week. And that was a proposed pilot, if you will, for a potential Thor live-action television series, which NBC passed on. And there were some funny moments with that Thor guzzling, like, a pitcher of beer, you know, he loved mead and beer, and he could drink the hell out of beer, that character, that version of Thor. And that was a pretty good little story. And Lee Purcell was in that, uh, who, a friend of the show, I would say, 
um, Pat McCormack interviewed just today. It just dropped. Um, go to uh, Golden Rage of TV on YouTube if you want to hear that interview. And she can't talk about her many television roles and movies because of the, as we're live, there's still the actor strike. And uh, she's a member of the Screen Actors Guild, of course, so she is prohibited from talking about this project. But she talks about some other things. She's doing a lot for actors who need help, retired actors, and uh, some charitable work. So it's, it's a really good interview worth your time. It's less than 40 minutes. Anyway, that's Lee Purcell. She played uh, David Banner's love interest in The Incredible Hulk Returns. Then, of course, just talking about Thor, we'll get back to Elizabeth Shue as we wrap on the topic and the little biography I did of Elizabeth Shue. Uh, pretty badly there when I got distracted by the text messages. I, I really effed up. But, of course, after the Incredible Hulk, Hulk returns from May 22nd, 1988, of course, we had the live action, meaning not a cartoon Thor blockbuster movie, distributed internationally by Paramount Pictures on Wednesday, April 27th, 2011. And then it opened in the United States on Friday, May 6th, 2011. By the way, May 6th is... My niece Molly's birthday. My 10-year-old niece who was introduced here in the Pod Blast last week here in the Nostalgic Pod Blast when she, the one I did about David McCollum passing away and Christopher Reeve when she reviewed the summer 2023 movies, The Little Mermaid, Elemental, and The Barbie Movie. Her birthday is May 6th. So I want to play a little clip of Elizabeth Shue talking about The Saint from March 14, 1997 when she was on the press junket. Do want to play that for you. And just a couple of the interviews with Elizabeth Shue, and then we're going to talk about some other nostalgic topics. Let's see if I can find that really quickly. My buddy's probably drunk. He's sitting here texting me. He always he always texts me when he's drunk. Um, mm -mm -mm. Sorry, buddy, if you're listening, but you know it's true. Let's see here. Let me get one un momento. Un momento. Elizabeth, we meet again. How nice. And congratulations to all of you on the saint. Oh, thank you. Should do well. Mm, I think so, too. Yeah, it uh, has a lot of uh, entertainment value to it. It has romance with mm -hmm. you and Val Kilmer. Mm -hmm. I guess in the original script, from what I know, it, uh, it didn't really call for that m much romance, did it? Hmm. Well, yeah, I think it wasn't really the focus of the film in the original script. And um, both the director and Val and I and the writer, you know, we really tried hard to, to make that more of the focus. And, and I'm really happy that it, that it is because I think um, um, most action adventures sometimes get lost in the explosions and, and you know, the bad guys and, and, uh, and the adventure. And they lose the sense of the characters and what they want and what they need from this adventure. So I'm glad that, that we have that focus. Well, I'm sure that yeah, audiences have would agree with you 100%. I can't read your text to respond to shit. And it's I a lot hear. to the film. Mm. I also understand that originally your character I know, was I know you going didn't know. to be... I know you didn't know. I don't know, know. what. I'm not mad. In any event, I'm just, I'm just clarifying. going to die. Um, well, no, it was more that um, that uh, originally oh, yeah. Uh, my, yeah, yeah, yeah. the relationship was You want to call we in? Needed, well, you sound we a little went late. back to film to do oh, some okay. more sh uh, shooting to be able to enhance our relationship. <laughs> That's really what happened. Please, yeah, you're welcome to. But the, well, hey, you're on now. Hey, hang on, hang on. No, to stay on. I'm going to um, put you on. Offer your thoughts on Elizabeth Shue. Yes, she was, okay. Hang on, <laughs> hang on a second. I'm playing it too. I know. I, know. It's just, I was just I'm thinking, you know, probably this whole between me and you and the camera. Um, it's probably good that we don't necessarily talk about that. You know, no. Just no, that's fine. But you know it's just I mean? to clarify. All right. Yeah. Just to clarify it. And how Hang on a second. This, and and all of the audience be able to see it for what it is and not think, what was that ending and what happened and now I didn't mention no names. And, so, you know I mean, I'm not it's mad. I hope you're not mad. For an audience to see a film clear without having to know all the, the background and stuff. But anyway, go on. You got me. <laughs> okay. That's okay. How was it in Russia? Was that a good experience? That's it was okay, buddy. really cool. It's okay. It was it's really okay. cool it's to cool. be there because um, I've been second. there a long time ago, and uh, and things had changed so much. So it was really fascinating to be able to go That's back. That's okay. And, and working it, there with the Russian it people ain't no was big really, deal. really interesting. And How did it change? Oh, well. Hang on. I'm gonna, I think the clip's um, about over. Well, 
Well, it's hard because in some ways it's changed. For I don't want to play too I, long a clip. It's pretty bad radio um, or audio, and because and people are able to come and go as they, as they want, and there is a lot. A clip of her talking about the saint from 1997. In some ways, with Val I think Kilmer. they're still struggling to find out their own identity because now that Western Let's civilization see. has come in and and uh, you know tried to. It's, it's a good movie. It's underrated. I think the people themselves are, are somewhat lost in the shuffle. Yeah. So I think it's going to take many years before yeah. they feel that the changes are. Good morning. Oh, we have some comments. Hey, Jerry. Oh, that's from the Nostalgia from the World. Hang on a second. Let me see where we're at. Was there it. any concern uh, among you people making the film how the Russian government would react to this? Because the villains are the Russians. Hmm. Well, um, I think that it's a fantasy. I'm are you excited all. about tomorrow's are. games and the Braves? I take the, them too seriously. I, I know. I mean, the Phillies are, are tough. Reality. But I think Russia, you know, is in a dangerous situation right now. I mean, there is the potential for this kind of upheaval. So I think there is some truth in the way it's portrayed. But, but again, it's a movie. Uh, hang on a second. Let me, I think the clip's about over. Yeah, it's good and to see you. Congratulations. And I won't ask you to explain the cold fusion theory. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we'll stop there. Um, I have a call. Actually, I made the call. It was my friend that was texting. But I want to acknowledge uh, Jerry Dobson is uh, watching live. And uh, I want to mention he has a cool Facebook group called Nostalgia World. And uh, he says, interesting stuff. Good morning. He says, well, you learn something new. I can't read the comment. Where is that? Oh, I see what I was trying to do. Hang on a second. I can't read the rest of the comment for some reason. Uh, hang on. One, un momento. Jerry Dobson says, learn something new every day. Yeah, I should have anticipated that's what, what his comment was. Thank you for being out there, brother. It's really early. Bucky Smith is out there. He's a DJ on the fish, so I gotta watch my language because uh, I'm a Christian and I I've messed messed up tonight. <laughs> but on the line, let me get this. Um, do you want to be identified, Carla? Uh, well, uh, am I on the air? Yeah, you're on the air, brother. Go ahead. Uh, uh, this is well, my you buddy Hunter. Find me. You can identify me. Yeah. Um. Yeah. Um. Well, I I, I saw that. I, I, I am guilty of the uh, as uh, being the texter that screwed up the uh, your, your broadcast, and I, I apologize. Um, you didn't but, know. Hey, I'm not mad, and and you know what? You know how I have a temper, and I overreact, so it wasn't a big deal. Ain't no problem, brother. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You you did mention that I had no. I I, I didn't know that you were on. on uh, that you were live on the air, but um. <clears throat> Yes, uh, I would like to comment about uh, Elizabeth Shue uh, from, I guess, the movie uh, Karate Kid was when uh, I kind of first noticed her, uh, and I thought I thought she was pretty cute and uh, you know played a very good role, uh, you know, uh, as the uh, love interest of uh, of the Karate Kid. Uh, I don't know. Uh, you know, Were you ever attracted to her? Because I wasn't. I, I considered her someone that was really talented and cute. Like they said, you know, a girl next door type. But I never had the hots for her. If you did, that's cool. What what were your thoughts about her just as a hot-blooded red American male? <laughs> well, I, I just, I, I thought she was just cute, you know, whatever. Uh, California girl. I mean, I guess she was, she was played the part of a California girl. Yeah, because she, she was from Nebraska and New Jersey. Yeah. <laughs> right. So and then not it, even from and educated California. in Boston. Yeah, in the Boston area. Right. Like the mother said, you know, all the girls out here are blonde. You know, the, the girl, the, the lady that played uh, Ralph Macchio's uh, mother. Yeah. She was like, God, the whole world's blonde out here. <laughs> <laughs> you know, they came from New Jersey as well, I believe. Uh, New York or something. Uh, but uh, anyway... Yeah, that's about all I gotta say about well, Elizabeth Shue. I know her brother played a uh, part uh, in uh, uh, Melrose the, uh, Place. Uh, Melrose, Melrose Andrew. Place, yeah. Yep. Yeah, Andrew Shue. Yeah, so they, they both have a little legacy, uh, I guess. Um, but and uh, and also Elizabeth Shue. I don't know if you mentioned her in that movie with uh, uh, 
Las Vegas. Uh, uh, Leaving Las Vegas, I did. She got an Oscar nomination. Yeah, great movie. Yeah, yeah, she was, she was great in that. Yeah, with Nicolas Cage. Um, you know, that, that's probably her best role. I don't know. Is, was she nominated for any, anything for that? She was nominated for an Oscar, and she won several awards. Yeah, I talked all about it. Yeah, man. Yeah, and that took her career to another level. It sure did. It showed her versatility and that she was a serious actor. I thought she was good in everything, though. She never turned in a bad performance. I like that uh, Piranha 3D. Did you ever see that? No, I never saw 2010, Piranha 3D. we have got to watch that. I have it on Blu-ray in 3D. It's it's an awesome comedy horror movie, a throwback to the 80s slasher movie. Really well done yeah. stuff, huh. if you're into that. Yeah, yeah. And Hollow Man, what about Hollow Man? We saw that together in the theater, I think, in 2000. <laughs> yeah, Kevin Hollow Bacon? Man great. Hollow Man's awesome! Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, uh, with, uh, with the actor. Kevin Bacon? <laughs> yeah, Kevin Bacon, and, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. There, there was a couple of scenes that were... Uh, that was the same guy that directed the uh, showgirls, wasn't it? And, and Robocop. He, I, I've mentioned this before. He's always got a damn rape scene. He's a Dutch director, Paul Verhoeven. It's like, what the hell, man? What's your yeah, yeah, deal? Was, exactly. Yeah, that guy, that guy's a crazy director. He's uh, probably like Oliver Stone. He's probably whacked out on crack or something. Who knows? I don't know. I'm just saying. He's probably whacked out on drugs. There was. Yeah, well, he always has to have some kind of rape scene, like you said. <laughs> it's like some ridiculous uh, violence or, or uh, you know, Something not not made for family view viewing, viewing. Uh, but uh, anyhow, um, <laughs> uh, what else about Elizabeth Shue? I guess that that Adventures in Babysitting. I wasn't really, uh, I didn't really watch that. I don't think. Uh, I did on cable, but yeah, I never saw it in the theater. I didn't rush out and see it. It wasn't. I wasn't in that demographic. Cocktail. Cocktail. That's yeah. We've talked about that. That was her best serious I mean like yeah. after doing a lot of smaller roles and she was like a Burger King pitch person for many yeah. years between 82 oh. and 84 yeah that was a great role absolutely yeah Cocktail was a great movie a great summer movie um you know um with Tom Cruise and uh you know on the beach and everything uh, that, that was a, a, a pretty good uh, I believe it was released in the summer wasn't it it had to have been. Right? Yeah. 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 So, yeah, that was a good summer movie. Was it back in, what, 87? 88. 88. Filmed in 87, released in 88. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, well. Um, I, gotta, I, have, I, I have a question for you. I need you to attest to something. Earlier in the show, I talked about how in Loki Season 2, this is not a spoiler, at the end of the first episode of Season 2, Right before the end credits, during the end credits, they show a McDonald's set in 1982. And they made a slight mistake, the set decorator. They didn't have any ashtrays on any of the tables in the McDonald's. Do you not remember ashtrays in the McDonald's in the 80s? Because I have on video, I have video proof. I talked about it earlier. I don't want to repeat myself. I have, remember that, do you ever remember that video I shot at Perimeter Mall where we were messing with people? Yes, and we're in the McDonald's and you see ashtrays everywhere. What? I can attest to that, yes. That's there right. Be, if, there were, if, there, if there were ashtrays, yes. It, yes, there were. There were these little tin, you know, probably not not very uh, uh, substantial, but uh, just, just little tin pieces of ashtrays that were on the table. Right, it had the M in it, the golden arches, in the middle of the ashtray. You can find them online. Anyone can Google McDonald's ashtray, McDonald Land ashtray. But hell, I remember smoking a cigarette in a McDonald's. Yeah. Before I quit, I, I, I quit smoking so. in 2010. But yeah. Yeah, when I was, uh, you know, uh, it was in the 80s. I, I, they probably got, uh, they probably weren't used much later than that. But uh, you know, as us teenagers, when we were uh, in the malls or, or whatever, going to McDonald's back in the day. Um, yeah, we would smoke cigarettes in McDonald's. Thank you for verifying that. Yes, yes, we would. <laughs> We're so proud. 
that we abuse tobacco. Um, you were always into dip. I, I, I never, I dipped a little bit, but one time I swallowed the dip juice and it just, it made me turned off from chewing tobacco for life. Yeah, that, that'll do it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you probably got really nauseous and yeah. had to lay, lay in your bed for a couple of hours. Didn't puke, but I felt like puking. You sure yeah. could. Smoking, smoking and non-smoking on an airplane. Like, what does that even mean? I know. It all is going to hit you. You can't escape from that smoke and that Airbus. I think it was 1991 that it was banned on airplanes, if I'm not mistaken. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'll look that up. Yeah. But, like, the smoke is going to carry through all, the whole plane. I know. You know, it's not like if you're non-smoking on a plane, it's not like you're not going to be inhaling secondhand smoke. Yeah, and, uh, we're Gen Xers, and the Generation X podcast is out there watching. How you doing? He said, it's too late for you to watch your language. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you said the F or F bomb. I get frustrated, man. It's that temper. Yeah, uh, I'm sorry, and, I, and maybe I, I have a reason. No, no, it's cool, dude. Um, It says here, I'm looking online, Congress passed legislation banning smoking on U.S. domestic flights. In less than two hours, which became effective in 1988, the law was made permanent and it's extended to flights of less than six hours in 1990. So I was off by a year. Yeah. It was implemented in 1990. And that must have really killed the Japanese. Those guys smoke like chimneys, and they still do. <laughs> I don't know about that. It's but, uh, I do remember, remember the movie Airplane and and non-smoking, and I kept smoking, and this ticket was had smoke coming off of it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that was a good guy. That was one of the first PG movies where I saw boobs, was in Airplane, in Airplane 2. Was that PG? Yeah. Like, that Back yeah, then, that they would show happen. breasts in a PG movie. Yeah. The rating system I mean, has changed. When PG-13 came along, that kind of changed things, you know? Where yeah. that became a PG-13 thing. Comes across the screen and jiggles. jiggles. Yeah. Talk about jiggle TV, jiggle movie screen. <laughs> yeah. and, and, all, and in part two, they're going through like the metal detector and you just see these boobs, these no face right. on the women. Just, just anyway. Yeah, Funny yeah. stuff, man. Adolescent yeah. humor at best, man. Oh, yeah, it was, man. It was good being a kid back in the 80s. Yeah, it was. <laughs> People weren't so damn uptight. I remember seeing with you uh, Passenger 57 in 1992 with Wesley Snipes. Yeah. Always bet on black. I love that I movie, love man. Uh. Yeah, that was a good movie. Before I let you go, uh, I want to see, yeah, the, the exact, you asked me when Cocktail was released. I told you 1988. I'll give you the specifics right fast quick of when it was released. Uh, where are you? Oh, here we go. Here's my dependable website. Okay, um, guess what? It only cost twenty million to make, but Cocktail made one hundred and seventy-one point five million at the box office. Released, wow. you're right, in the summer, July 29th, nineteen eighty-eight, by Disney, Buena Vista Pictures Distribution, and Touchstone Pictures. Yeah, yeah, it's a good movie. Yeah, it's, I should watch that again. <laughs> it's got to be streaming somewhere. Let me look. Um, for the listeners and the viewers, cocktail movie is stream. Sometimes this is not accurate information. When I look up or somewhere streaming, stream is a shell game. It can be streaming on Netflix and then it'll go somewhere else. And, you know, you know how it goes. They say it's on Prime Video on Amazon Prime cocktail. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you might have paid three ninety nine dollars for it. But everything's on Prime. That's what pisses me off is you're paying a monthly fee and they have movies you have to pay to see that are old movies. Exactly. Not like video on demand of new stuff. I'm like, what the F? Yeah. Yeah, yeah I go there. It's, it's on Prime. I go there and it's like, yeah, if you want to pay four ninety nine, then it's on Prime. And I already have a, a, a subscription. Right. 
<laughs> but that's how, that's how that's the new world order, as they say. Yeah, we thought we could cut the cord to save a buck, but now even that's catching up to us because there's so many great streaming services out there. And if you get them all, it, it's going to add. I think it's probably still about maybe 40% less, 40 to 60% less than a traditional cable bill to have like the premium movie channels and all that jazz. Yeah, if you just cut the cord completely and just got your whichever uh, services you wanted. And, and you, you don't have to, and, and you can get out of it and then get back in it. You know, you, you can get out of, uh, you know, uh, Disney or whatever and. And, and reorder it two months later, and, it, 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 and you don't get grandfathered in to a price, is what I'm trying to say. You you uh, you can cancel it and then still get it two months later for the same price. It's not like you have a contract or or you're grandfathered in to a lower rate. It, 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 you know what I mean? Right on. I know exactly what you mean. <laughs> well said. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, you can juggle streaming services if you want you know which i'm doing you know? yeah uh quick question for you off topic candy corn yay or nay eh. if you mix candy corn with peanuts it's a payday bar i love that i do that too that's right i forgot about that i did that last year Otherwise, it's just pure sugar, you know, and everything in moderation with me, man. I haven't had candy corn this season yet, Halloween season 2023, but I'm going to get just one bag, one of the Brock's, that's my brand, Brock's candy corn. Later in the show, I'm going to talk about the origin of candy corn. Originally, they were called chicken feed in the 1800s. Huh. Wow. <laughs> I don't know what chicken feed, huh? Yeah. All right. Hey, Jerry Dobson said the strike is over, and I know the writer's strike is. I guess maybe there's some breaking news on the acting side. Did you see anything on your phone? Well, about... well one, would go, one would follow the other, it would seem like, right? Because Yeah, I, I would. Mean, well, the, the writers should be, should, uh, I think it's systematic. The writers are going to get, because the writers have to be uh, uh, let go first so they can write for the actors. <laughs> you mean not let go, but right, they need to be hired. They need to be I, I, in I the mean, clear. Hired. Let's see if they're if it's over. Actors Guild, SAG after a major studios continue negotiations. He might have meant the writer's strike, because I, I was mentioning how uh, a buddy of mine who has a great podcast about classic TV, uh, Golden Rage of TV, he interviewed Lee Purcell, and I know you may not know who she is, but she's been in a lot of stuff you have seen, and she couldn't talk about any of her acting in his interview. He did a 45-minute interview with her, and she's like, I'm prohibited from talking about this till the strike is over. So she's just talking about her charity work and other things. Anyway, still interesting, but, you know. Yeah. She was a beautiful yeah, woman. Like, Probably She still is, too. Yeah, yeah. So you're saying the writer's strike is over? The writer's I mean, strike is that, definitely that, over. That was that, settled. That, yeah. But the Screen Actors Guild is not. Now, here's the thing. Now, this is, I'm not being controversial. I'm being realistic. I hate to say it, actors, but actors are a dime a dozen. There's good-looking people, and that's why everywhere. I mean, just look around. I well, think writer, writers, writers, dime writers, dime dime. writers are needed more than actors because writers create the content. Actors perform the content. Listen, I've done acting work myself. Hell, Guy Pierce who recently had a birthday. I was his henchman in Lawless. I tarred and feathered a bootlegger. I've been on sets. I know I know what it takes to make a movie. I see it. That's why I don't like critics tearing a movie apart because I've seen how many hours, sometimes 16 hours in a shooting day, it takes to make a movie or television show. But um, I'm not going to be so cold. I could make like a joke just to be an a-hole and say, you know, these actors, they need to go back to waiting tables because they're a dime a dozen. And there's always a good-looking person to take their place. No, I'm not going to say that. I know I just did, but I don't really think yeah. that. Well, that's why you're wrong. Just because you're good-looking doesn't mean you're a good actor. That's true. Talent. Absolutely. You know, just because the camera loves you. Good-looking people are a dime a dozen. Yeah. 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 Ye
dime a dozen. Actually, actors are not. Actors are, are special. Thespians. In my opinion. Thespians with a T. Hear me clearly. Thespians, yeah. yeah. It's yeah, acting, my boy. Lewis. There's only one Daniel Day Lewis. I mean, <laughs> there's, there's many pretty people in Hollywood that are trying to be actors, but there's only like five actors. True, and AI, AI can't do inflections. I've seen AI recent where it looked like the person, but they sounded all off with the inflections and the way that they speak yeah. the written word. It's all wrong. Yeah, I don't artificial think that's intelligence. Ever work. I, I don't, yeah, no, I don't think that's ever going to work. Uh, as far as them replacing actors, I mean, maybe it will, but you're going to know. Uh, you know, and. They're never going to capture, like, the human the emotion, human spirit. I, I just really don't see that happening where AI is going to take over I agree. Uh, Hollywood as, as far as you, you're going to know it's not real. People are not that stupid. Well, I mean, but the, the mantra out there by some is that the Hollywood producers and the people that are cutting the checks and the production companies feel, some of them, um, that actors are expendable. And they, you know, and yeah. but also it's the the use of the image. Now, extras have been screwed over for a long time, like on The Walking Dead. Oh, when I was an extra on The Walking Dead, there. some, not me, but some, well, I was put on a pinball machine, not prominently, but the image could be used on merchandising and you don't get paid a dime. There's no residuals or anything. So this was affecting the principal actors as well. But you know what? I mean, I feel bad for the principals, but extras have been taken advantage of for decades in the industry and it's because they're always looking for a fresh face if you look at the casting people they always want a fresh face that don't know the rules and the ins and outs that unfortunately can be taken advantage of anyway yeah yeah it's going to open a whole new can of worms <laughs> you know and i'm not really happy about that part of ai i, I think ai might be good for some things but not for entertainment Definitely not. Maybe a video game or something, but damn. Right, right, right. Like video games and stuff like that, but not for like, you know, because we watch movies for like, <laughs> for, I don't know. We don't, we don't want uh, fake acting, fake uh, AI. Uh, I mean, CGI is good, but <laughs> not like a real, an actor trying to portray human emotion that is not even a real person. That's just kind of depressing. And and bad CGI can ruin a movie. It can sink a film. Can you imagine bad AI acting? I mean, it it would destroy the credibility of a movie, and it wouldn't make any money. Yeah. It would be trash. I can see them doing it like in a baseball movie, or or, or a movie with a big crowd. Maybe they'll, they'll put some of the AI people like out in the crowd. They did that with me in one of the Hunger Games movies. I was one of the people selected just to be, like, photographed to be duplicated for peanuts, you know, for peanut pay. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah, something like that. <laughs> yeah, I can see them doing, like, AI for that. And in sporting that's event scenes. A main elite actor. Yeah, they do that. They've been doing that all the time for, like, movies that are, that are sports-themed, like uh, Trouble with the Curve, for instance, the Clint Eastwood movie about baseball, about a pitcher. Um, you know, in football shows, there was a terrible show on the USA Network based on the movie Necessary Roughness, and they couldn't use NFL teams, so they had these phony names of football teams and stuff. I mean, there was some good acting in it. When I say terrible, I mean terrible meaning it's so unrealistic because they couldn't use any NFL properties. You know what I'm saying? It's like Kathy Allen was in that movie. In the movie, yeah, but in the TV show, it was all this nondescript, like, <laughs> oh, like... Uh, the New Orleans. <coughs> I'm sorry, I can't speak. <coughs> uh, I can't remember. I'm trying to think. I had one tip my tongue, and that just went in and out of my mind. Not being quick tonight, like uh, the New Orleans oh, Nayweathers or something. That wasn't it. But I had a better one that fit Orleans. New Orleans. You know, just they had the stupidest names of phony NFL teams. Is my point on that right, show, right. Necessary Roughness, right. on the USA Network. I'm trying to think of any, anything else, but uh, 
Well, she just turned 60, is that right? Yeah, 6 0. She's 60. Mm -hmm. Wow. Man. Time flies, man. Yes, and Karate Kid, she was what? But it was, she was probably about 23 in that. I, I think she was older. <laughs> she looked, <laughs> actually, she looked older than Ralph Macchio. <laughs> but I think Ralph Macchio was older than her. Um, and, and Karate Kid. But anyway. Oh, yeah, he is. He, he is older than her. That I know that yeah. for a fact. But um, we had some comments coming in. Samantha Livingston commented. And I guess she deleted it, but she was saying how um, how she married. No, she was saying Elizabeth Shue married her husband at the right time. It was the gist of her comment. Uh, I, I know her. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but we better leave it at that. Um, <clears throat> all right. Well, uh, thanks for uh, being a part of the Pod Blast. Uh, and I'll holler at you tomorrow and go Braves as we're live. You know, I'm, I'm a little nervous about the Phillies, but we're not going to talk about sports right now. But uh, knock on wood, the Phillies, though, they, they just seem to be on a mission. But the Braves are the best yeah. in baseball. So, and we got we got our ace on the mound tomorrow. Yeah. Strider, record breaker. He broke John yeah. Smoltz's record recently. Yeah, the Braves have broke a lot of records this year. Yeah. Um, so they're, they're still on baseball. top of the hill until someone knocks us off. We got the home field advantage. We'll see, but I don't want to turn this into a sports show. This is a nostalgia show, no. and it's going to be dated <laughs> real soon. When I talk about games that are happening within 24 hour period, actually now within like 16 hours or something. All right, as we're live, talk to you later, brother. Thanks again for your input. You you were great. I like what you had to say. Yes, well, thank you. It was a pleasure. Thanks, brother. All right, bye. Okay. That's Hunter Golson. All right. Um. And he was the guy that was texting me. He didn't know. He didn't know, man. I'm sorry. And I feel bad. Like I was admonishing him on the air. Um, well, the strike, Jerry Dobson, if you're still out there, Jerry with a G, like Jerry Anderson, talk about him later in the show, uh, a producer. Um, it is over on the writing side, but apparently there's some good inroads with the negotiations on the actor side. And I hope that gets resolved so we can, uh, so it can move on. So uh, you heard a little bit of Elizabeth Shue talking about The Saint, where we left off on her press junket way back in 1997. Can't believe how long ago 1997 was as a Gen Xer. Seems like yesterday when the Star Wars special editions were in the theater and The Saint that she was in was in the theater and Titanic, or as I joke, Titanic, because of that scene with Kate Winslet being painted as one of the French girls. Uh, <laughs> oh, boy. Um... I want to talk or play and more of Elizabeth, and we're, I'm about done talking about Elizabeth Shue. This isn't the biography channel, um, and I don't want to bore you with too much Elizabeth Shue, but I think she's significant. I guess I'll resume a little bit with her talking about the saint. I don't know if you were digging this interview or not. There's not much left to it, so that I can take a little break and rest my vocal cords, because uh, I still have a lot to cover with you in this edition of The Nostalgic Pod Blast. Please hit up our YouTube channel. If you're listening at Fistful of Radio out of Atlanta or uh, on the podcast platforms like Podbean or Spotify, can't say Stitcher because they did away with their podcast. And Google Podcasts are going away. They made an announcement. They're going to have another, in 2024, another podcasting um, service uh, that they've been announcing. But let's listen to a little bit more of Elizabeth Shue. Because I really like the Saints, so I'm a little biased here. I hope I'm not boring you with this, but here we go. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Sorry about having that answer. Or we won't. <laughs> this is the weirdest interview because they're showing a makeup person and an audio person in the middle of this interview adjusting the host's microphone. Bobby Wygant. God. We meet again. How nice. And congratulations to all of you on the Saint. Oh, thank you. This might be another take. So you know what? I am going to move on. I didn't pre-screen all of that clip. I watched half of it. So um, now let's talk about Piranha 3D briefly. And I'll show you that cool Blu-ray case for the watcher as I play this for the listener and the watcher. Elizabeth Shue in a Piranha 3D interview from 2010. And I like this. Sam? Something bit me. Sam, 
What are you seeing down there? Oh my god. Sam! When I think of a movie like Piranha 3D, I don't associate that with Elizabeth Shue. <laughs> so, <laughs> what made you interested in that character? Um, well, I, um, I loved the director. He's a great director, and I knew that it would be a classy version of Piranha 3D, if that's possible. <laughs> um, and, um, and I get to be an action hero. I'm the sheriff. Yes, I you are. Save, yeah, I have to save the town. I have to save my family. Um, so I got to show off how, how, what a great, you know, kind of action hero-y heroine I can actually be. Now, was it all worth it? It was, ri yeah, it was worth it. And it was hard. There was a lot of difficult, challenging days of lots of action in 112 degree weather. So, um, yeah, it was definitely challenging, but it was worth it. It's such a fun movie. I'm so happy with the way it turned out. She, um, she's in charge of the town, and the town has just been um, invaded by thousands of prehistoric piranha. There is a subterranean earthquake that was opened up just as a wet t-shirt contest is going on on a floating stage. And um, I'm called in to save the day, and I'm not able to, but um, I, do, um, I do save my kids. There's a lot of iconic um, actors in this film. There's um, Richard Dreyfuss. Right. Yes. Was that the intent of Alexander Aja, the director? Yes. Um, I think he grew up as a kid loving the American 80s movies, and he's um, French, so he, you know, his point of view is very, uh, a little bit more detached. And so he loved the idea of all these kind of iconic 80s actors coming together and then doing a movie that was, you know, that felt like Jaws, but was even more extreme and more over the top and more fun. I want to know what the hell this thing is doing in my lake. Is that a piranha? This particular piranha vanished two million years ago. You have such interesting choices lately in your career. You played yourself in Hamlet 2, which is a funny, funny, funny film, and you were so great in it. And now Piranha 3D. I mean, uh, you're having fun in your career right now, don't you? <laughs> I'm trying to. Definitely trying to have a little more fun. Um, it's a, it's, a, it's a long haul, and uh, you have to just kind of keep working, and whatever opportunity presents itself, you kind of have to not take, yourself, not take yourself so seriously and just, just kind of take a chance every once in a while. Because there's so many that never make it out anyway, so, you know, why, why overthink things? What can we expect from Miss Elizabeth Shue coming up? It's not going to be like Alligator 3D, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It could be. It, it could, could be. be. <laughs> I heard that they're doing a, um, a, a really interesting independent movie with um, the Winter's Bone, Jennifer Lawrence, actress. Is that yeah, true? Yeah, yeah. We're working on it right now in Ottawa. Yeah, she's awesome. Um, it's a really interesting movie. It's kind of Disturbia meets Psycho. And, um, and then there's a movie that I, I did um, last year that's going to be in the Toronto Film Festival called Janie Jones with Abigail Breslin. And I got to play a really complicated, dark meth addict mom. Wow. So um, I got to go back into that territory a little bit and reconnect to, um, to a little more complicated role. Piranha hunt packs. The first bite draws blood. The blood draws the pack. It's just, it's just fun. It's like a roller coaster ride. And, you know, when you go to see a big movie, like this, that's what you expect. You want to be taken away, and you want to laugh, and you want to scream, and and uh, it definitely provides all of that. And it's all in full glorious 3D. Mm, things pop out at you, <laughs> fish come at you. Oh, yeah, cool. Well, thank you so much, Miss Elizabeth. Visit us in Palm Springs sometime. I'd love to. <laughs> Love that movie! Great for the Halloween season. Any season. It, whether it's Halloween 2023 or beyond. It holds up. I mean, it's a 2010 movie. Jerry, Jerry uh, O'Connell, who's on that talk show, The Talk, and he's like a game show host now for Pictionary. He plays this guy like a, a Girls Gone Wild producer, like a D-bag. 
And there's a funny scene where a family show, but he gets his comeuppance in a big way where his lower half of his body is eaten away. And during the end credits in 3D, you see a prosthetic wee-wee. And, <laughs> and one of the piranha gnaw on it, and they go, yeah, and spit it out. Yeah, 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 yeah. And spit his penis out. It's hilarious. It's like dark comedy. But um, you heard some of the cast in that. I mean, Richard Dreyfuss from Jaws, for goodness sakes. Um, Michael J. I mean, uh, Christopher Lloyd, who also played a Klingon in Star Trek Three: The Search for Spock. I have had enough of you. He, Kirk kicks his ass into the core of uh, the Genesis planet after he uh, basically murdered his son, David. Anyway, I'm digressing, but being nostalgic, I hope. But uh, I highly recommend Piranha 3D. They made a sequel. I bought it, and I never watched it because I heard it's not very good. I mean, and a lot of people say critics, oh, it's not very good. The original, the hell you say, sir or madam, it's got everything you want in a throwback to the 1980s horror movie and the quality of an actor like Elizabeth Shue. Now, I have another clip of her I'm going to play. Um I'm not boring y'all with these clips of her, but I, this is, I want to give this day justice, uh, you know, where she turned 60, because I think she is a Tom Cruise. She's like a female Tom Cruise in terms of her iconic status as a movie star, whether you agree with it or not. That's that's just my opinion, and you have a right to your opinion, too. Uh, and I got an interview with her talking about The Boys, something more recent, but let's listen to this one really quickly. Oh, I can't play that song. Lots yes, sir. let me just play a little bit of it. The Who! You were in Leaving Las Vegas, uh, nominated for an Academy Award, now CSI Las Vegas. What's going on with you in Vegas? <laughs> I obviously like the place an awful lot. And the feeling of working on a hit show that can be notoriously eerie and occasionally a bit gross? Well, in the beginning, I have to say I was a little grossed out by the crime scenes at times, but now I really enjoy it. I think the, the, the worse, the most, more blood there is, the better. All right, let me give it a whirl. I decided to try my hand at solving a murder as I worked this crime at CSI, the investigation at MGM. I tried to find that same level of comfort. My attempt at bravery in the face of a criminal investigation, not quite the same. Elizabeth enjoys the environment so much she even helps the actors playing the deceased. And I like to take care of the dead bodies, actually. I really <laughs> worry for the people who played the dead bodies. I'm worried about their heads. They have to like, sometimes lie on cement for hours on end. You bring them coffee? Um, I should. Or a pillow. <laughs> Before CSI, there was a long film career. So does constantly getting asked about 80s classics like the Karate Kid get old? No, I love it. I feel very fortunate that some of my films have sort of broken through into the culture, um, especially in the 80s. After all these films, what is she most proud of? Finishing college. And not just any college. And I graduated from Harvard. But I graduated when I was 37. So. Still, it's Harvard. Any right. age counts. She's acted in 52 films. Her favorites? Adventures in Babysitting was very special. And um, Leaving Las Vegas. Okay, that was a Five great words. interview. I'm not going to let this clip, two years this ad play. All right, screw that ad. And then this is the final one. This isn't very long. I want to play a recent interview. Well, somewhat recent. We're in the end of 2023. This is from 2019, where Elizabeth Shue's talking about The Boys on Amazon Prime. Just to kind of get started, uh, what, what appealed to you about The Boys? What made you want to be a part of it? Um, I just, I loved the writing. It was so intelligent. Um, I loved all the characters. I thought were very authentic and interesting and different. The world was exciting and different, and I loved my character. I just thought she was really um, complicated and a character I don't usually get a, a chance to play. So yeah, everything about it I liked. <laughs> what about yourself? I didn't know anything about it in the, in the first place. I got the script, I was looking at something else, I barely read it. <laughs> and just, I was like trying to juggle five things at once and then <clears throat> when I finally did read it, again, it's the material, what was on the page, it's like, this is actually, it's really interesting. So, um, investigated further and then realized he was involved with it and, and went, I mean, kind of a no-brainer <laughs> when, when I saw who was involved and what the material was. Did you guys go and read the graphic novels or was sort of the, the script the only template you used? I read the graphic novel. I did, but and I think 
you know, with, I mean, the graphic novel, if you just put it straight on screen, would be unwatchable for anyone outside of prison. <laughs> so we had to tone it down. We had to just sort of, you know, make it palatable to an audience because, you know, networks like audiences. Sure. And uh, <laughs> I think we've done that, you know. We've maintained the integrity of, uh, uh, of the show, uh, of the comic, at the same time making it accessible to a wide range of, of, of people. Are you a superhero genre fan at all? Um, yeah, sometimes. I mean, I, I think I was when they first started coming out. I have to say that after, after a while as an actor, you do feel a little bit like, oh, why do they keep making those films? Because there, are, it's difficult, obviously, to find characters in them for you, so it's difficult to find work in general. But um, I think what's wonderful about this show is that we we wouldn't be here without the superhero genre. But we get to take that genre yeah. and make it character driven, so that. I can actually be in this. <laughs> they don't have a place for me in usual superhero movies, but there's a place for me here. Right. That says a lot about well, the show. Well, she's She's allergic to spandex. <laughs> <laughs> it's something else, this show. Um, without spoiling too much, what can you tell people about what they kind of can expect from your characters? Your characters. I, I don't even know what to say about him. <laughs> Well, I'd like to hear what you have to say about him. Uh, well, let me fill in the blanks. He, he's a complicated chap. Um, I think he would believe that he's the most misunderstood character on the show. And I think, to be honest, I think he's the weakest character on the show. I think, you know, super strength uh, is, is one thing. But I think his, um, if we want to make a Superman comparison, which I'm loath to do a little bit, but his kryptonite would be his humanity. And I think she brings that out of him, so that complicates this relationship. For sure. And yeah, we, what, what would you say about his character and the um, things he does? Well, I love him. <laughs> <laughs> I need him. And um, I, I want him to be the best that he can be. <laughs> and when he's, when he's happy, then I'm happy. <laughs> and safe. <laughs> all right. And I know he'll, prote he'll, he'll protect me. <laughs> At all costs, yeah. obviously. <laughs> I don't think I can play much more of that song. I'll get booted by the bots. Those damn bots. Hey, I want to thank everyone out there that's watching live. Um, I'm monitoring the comments and the feed. I really appreciate it. Um, I'll read them in just a sec. But I just want to wrap on Elizabeth Shue and just say, Happy 60th birthday. Not that you'll ever hear or see this. Happy 60th birthday to Elizabeth Shue, who I think is an absolutely iconic actress on par with a Tom Cruise in terms of longevity, talent, and diverse pop culturally significant movie and television roles. Now we're going to shift gears in a major way and pivot past celebrating Elizabeth Shue. And uh, I'm going to play a clip from a television classic. Um, I'm talking about the Honeymooners. And uh, we're going back to 1951 because I'm going to play a rare, rare song that... Uh, Jackie Gleason and Audrey Meadows sang from my video collection that's not on YouTube. I tried to find it on YouTube for a clean audio rip, and I couldn't find it. But um, this is a song performed in 1954. But just to set the stage as we shift gears, the Honeymooners debuted as a skit on live television back on Friday, October 5th, 1951. And it was a six-minute sketch on a television show called Cavalcade of Stars on a network that not many have heard of called the Dumont Television Network. And this was Jackie Gleason's first variety series, which aired on that Dumont Television Network. And that series, Cavalcade of Stars, first aired on Saturday, June 4th, 1949. Wow, that was a long time ago. Several generations ago. Um, ensemble cast member Art Carney made a brief appearance in that very first six-minute skit, playing not his buddy and neighbor, Ed Norton, but he played a police officer 
who's hit with flour that Ralph throws out of the window when he's on the street. Art Carney is the cop, and he comes up where he has flour all over his uniform, all over his face. And Pert Kelton, K-E-L-T-O-N, Pert Kelton, played Alice Cramden a year before Audrey Meadows took over the role. So I'm going to play a little bit first of the introduction to the very first Honeymooner skit ever from 1951. I'm not going to play the whole skit. That would be, you know, bad audio. But I'm going to play the introduction, which is actually good audio. Um, here it is, the first ever Honeymooner skit. Where are you, my little friend? Great institution, the honeymoon, is the time when the ship of life is launched upon the sea of matrimony. Well, this evening, Jackie Gleason introduces two brand new characters, Ralph and Alice Cramden, the honeymoon, whose boat has sprung a leak. Well, as the curtain opens, we find Alice preparing dinner for Ralph, who is due home from a hard day driving a bus. What do you mean, go down to Krause's and get some bread? Go down to Krause's and get some bread, that's what I mean. Oh, I know what you mean. But what do you mean, go down to Krause's and get some bread? What's the matter with you? I happen to be frying the dinner. There's a big dish. There's a big dish. You're frying the dinner. What did you do all day, stand there frying the dinner? Ralph, I'm not in the mood for it. Just don't start up with me, Ralph. I'm not in the mood for it. Fine. That's fine. It's okay with me. I won't start up with you. Don't you ask me to go down to Crosses for any bread. All right, I'll stop it there. Um, the thing that's most interesting is that Jackie Gleason was thin in those early skits, those live skits that he performed. And the show eventually changed networks and went to CBS, and Jackie Gleason signed a huge contract. And Pert Kelton eventually had to leave the show, reportedly because of a um, heart condition. And uh, Audrey Meadows auditioned twice because the first time, Jackie said, she's too pretty. Can't do it. So the second time, reportedly, in my book, I'll show before the camera later that I've read. I've read many books about the Honeymooners. Audrey Meadows showed up without any makeup on, looking very disheveled with uh, her hair all messed up. And she won the role of Alice Crandon because she didn't look like the beautiful lady she did in the first audition. And she, you know, she looked totally different. And uh, Jackie Gleason bought her performance. And the rest is history. So um, the Honeymooners were a series of live skits as a part of the Jackie Gleason show on CBS. Not Cavalcade of Stars, that was Dumont. Um, when he signed, there was a lot of fanfare when he signed that deal with CBS, kind of like Dave Letterman leaving NBC for CBS in 1993 into 1994. A lot of fanfare. You know, I can imagine that back in the 50s with Jackie Gleason. And there was a really cool biopic called Gleason uh, that I recommend from 2002. It's excellent. And it's it's been streaming out there in streaming land. And uh, I have it on video from when it aired back in 2002. I thought it was fantastic. Brad Garrett played uh, Ralph Cramden. He did a fantastic job. Um, and there's a different opening to the classic 39. Everyone knows this, but for those out there that don't know, it was a live skit, and it became a regular show. And that's why there were 39 episodes that were filmed in, in, uh, in 1955 to 1956. It debuted in October 1955. But before that, I want to mention that Jackie Gleason released a lot of hit records. And um, we'll get to that in a little bit. But I, I'm jumping ahead. I'm not a very good storyteller. Um, so why am I doing what I'm doing <laughs> on a show? 
But I want to mention there was an album titled And Away We Go, which was released in May of 1954 on Capitol Records, catalog number H-511. It sounds like a planet in the MCU, the Marvel Comics Universe or whatever. Uh, But it was catalog number H-511. And Away We Go became one of the most popular best-selling albums on the Billboard magazine pop album chart in June of 1954. And one of the tracks was titled One of These Days, Pow! The album version is not at all like the version performed live on the Jackie Gleason show Honeymooner skit, which I'm going to play from May 15th, 1954 in a skit on the Jackie Gleason show. Uh, And this is from a great I ripped it from a DVD set that MPI Home Video released, I think back in, yeah, back in 2011, which then would have been the 60th anniversary of the first skit of the Honeymooners, and it has everything, and they have things that had never been released before. What a kinescope is, is when um, there is a camera rolling on a monitor of a live show, it's filming on 16 millimeter film, typically a monitor. So the quality isn't great in most cases but it's better than nothing i mean they didn't have videotape back in those days back in the in the early and mid 1950s so i want to play if i can get away with it with the bots the album version of one of these days one of these days pow and then i'm going to play this rare version that's not on youtube that i prefer you'll hear a different uh a vocalist a female vocalist uh singing alice's lines in the album version but it's best with Audrey Meadows, and the lyrics are a little bit, little bit different. But um, let me see if I can find that. Yeah, here it is from the that record. Uh, and away we go. Hopefully, uh, I can get away with playing this without the bots interfering. It's three minutes long. You're a darling. You're an angel, and I love ya, but you always get me steamed somehow. You just gotta stop before I blow my top. One of these days, one of these days, pow! On our honeymoon, I took ya. To Niagara And it ended In a great big row Oh, you did me wrong You brought your ma along One of these days One of these days Pow! When my shirts need a button Where are you? When my socks get holy, what do you do? When I come home hungry and upset, a cold dinner and an argument is all I ever get. Though you tell me that you positively love me, maybe I don't understand. Somehow, though I'm six foot tall, you make me feel so small. One of these days, one of these days, pow! When my shirts need a button, where are you? When my socks get holy, what do you do? When I come home hungry and upset A cold dinner and an argument is all I ever get Though you tell me that you positively love me Maybe I don't understand somehow Though I'm six foot tall you make me feel so small one of these days one of these days pow right in the kisser one of these days one of these days pow right now 
Baby, you're the great. I love that. Now, I kind of messed up. That, that's right. There were no lines for Alice. Rayleigh really, Ralph is singing Alice's lines. Now, you're going to hear Audrey Meadows say her own lines, and there's a little bit different lines, and I just think it's wonderful. Um, let's see here. Here it is. This is from a skit on May, f Saturday, May, uh, let me tell you real quick the date, May 15th, 1954, Jackie Gleason Show, and the skit was called What's Her Name? They're trying to think of the name of an actress in a movie they just seen. Uh, the dame that fell down the elevator shaft and lost her memory, Ralph says. Anyway, it's a funny skit. So at the end of the skit, they perform the song, and this was, of course, to promote the record album single uh, in reality. But let's listen to this performance. You're a darling. You're an angel. And I love you. But you always get me sting somehow. You just gotta stop before I blow my top. One of these days, one of these days, pow! On our honeymoon, I took you to Niagara, and it ended in a great big crowd. Ah, you did me wrong. You brought your mother along. One of these days, one of these days, pow! When my shirts need a button, where are you? When my socks get holy, what do you do? When I come home hungry and upset, a cold dinner and an argument is all I ever get. Though you tell me that you positively love me, maybe I don't understand somehow. Though I'm six foot tall, you make me feel so small. One of these days, one of these days, pow! When my dress needs zipping, where are you? When I feel romantic, what do you do? This is strictly between the two of us. Ralph, you're not the greatest love of us. You sure can drive a bus. In spite of all your faults, I'm crazy. Yes, I'll wind up with a wrinkled brow. You're my angel child. My angel child. But one of these days, one of these days, ah! run in the kisser. One of these days, one of these days, ah! I really like that. I thought Audrey Meadows performed that brilliantly. Um, and that's very rare, but you can find it on the MPI DVD release of the 60th anniversary. They may have released one for the 70th anniversary of the debut of the Honeymooners in 2021. Not sure, but uh, that's an awesome set. But throughout the 1950s and the 1960s, Jackie Gleason enjoyed a prominent secondary music career, producing a series of best-selling mood music albums with jazz overtones for Capitol Records. Jackie Gleason believed there was a ready market for romantic instrumentals. His goal was to make musical wallpaper that should never be intrusive, but conducive, unquote. He recalled seeing Clark Gable play love scenes in movies. The romance was, in his words, magnified a thousand percent by background music. Jackie Gleason reasoned, if Gable needs music... A guy in Brooklyn must be desperate, unquote. Jackie Gleason's first album, Music for Lovers Only, still holds the record for the longest stay on the Billboard Top 10 charts at 153 weeks. And his first 10 albums sold over a million copies each. At one point, Jackie Gleason held the record for charting the most number one albums on the Billboard 200 without charting any hits on the Top 40 of the Billboard Hot 100 Singles charts. Jackie Gleason could not read or write music. 
He was said to have conceived melodies in his head and described them vocally to assistants who transcribed them into musical notes. These included the well-remembered themes to both the Jackie Gleason show, titled Melancholy Serenade, and the Honeymooners theme, You're My Greatest Love, which I'll play in a second. Uh, in spite of period accounts establishing his direct involvement in musical production, varying opinions have appeared over the years as to how much credit Gleason should have received for the finished products. Biographer William A. Henry wrote in his 1992 book titled The Great One, The Life and Legend of Jackie Gleason, that beyond the possible concept of many of the song melodies, Gleason had no direct involvement, such as conducting, in making their recordings. Red Nichols, a jazz great who had fallen on hard times and led one of the group's recordings, was not paid as a session leader. <clears throat> trumpeter the guy that played a trumpet bobby hackett soloed on several of gleason's albums and was leader for seven of those records asked late in life by musician journalist harry curry in toronto what gleason really did at recording sessions hackett replied he brought the checks but years earlier hackett had glowingly told writer james bacon that Jackie knows a lot more about music than people give him credit for. I have seen him conduct a 60-piece orchestra and detect one discordant note in the brass section. He would immediately stop the music and locate the wrong note. It always amazed the professional musicians how a guy who technically did not know one note from another could do that. And he was never wrong. The composer and arranger George Williams has been cited in various biographies of Jackie Gleason as having served as a ghostwriter for the majority of arrangements heard on many of Jackie Gleason's albums of the 1950s and the 1960s. Williams was not given credit for his work until the early 1960s, albeit only in small print on the backs of album covers. Nearly all of Jackie Gleason's albums have been reissued on compact disc. Gleason's lead role in the musical Take Me Along in 1959 to 1960 won him a Tony Award for Best Performance by a Leading Actor in a Musical. Incredible. And Jackie Gleason broke a leg live on TV on the Jackie Gleason show. And reportedly he had a photographic memory where he could look at a script and memorize the lines instantly. And also, supposedly, he was a heavy drinker. He loved kegs of beer and pizza, which is why he ballooned in weight during the classic 39 Honeymooner. Speaking of that, I'm going to play the rare 30-second opening to the classic 39 episodes where you hear the sponsor's tag, and also it shows a car in on camera in the shot. But uh, listen to the slightly different announcements. It's the same words, but a different version of it. And this is the original 19... October 1955 opening to the classic Honeymooners 30-minute 30, 30 show, which was not live. It was taped before a live, or filmed rather, before a live studio audience. Not a live track, it was a real audience, just like the live Jackie Gleason show and the Cavalcade of Stars before that. And um, it was on the Dumont Network. It came back onto the Dumont Network for the classic 39, as they were known, and then, to get ahead in the story, Jackie Gleason, in 1984, held a press conference, and he unveiled, whoops, look what I found. I found all these films of the live Honeymooner skits. So suddenly you had hundreds of skits. And over the years, even recently, they've been finding other kinescopes of other episodes that were presumed to be lost forever. There's a skit called The Turkey from Thanksgiving 1952, which, to my knowledge, has yet to be found. Um, I would love to see that where Ralph brings a live turkey into the apartment. But let's listen to the original opening, how it aired in 1955, in the fall of 55, for the new half-hour Honeymooner show, which only lasted one season of 39 episodes. Joyce Randolph. 
Hall. Brought to you by... Your Buick dealer. And away we go. Oh, no. That's how it sounded, and... Uh... It was pretty incredible because you saw the bus. You saw Ralph Cramden's bus at long last. And I don't know why this won't put into syndication, um, but they weren't. But look on YouTube if you want to see how that looked. And pretty soon on this show, you are going to see video clips. Um, since I got a supercomputer I talked about in the very beginning of the show that has a tray where I can play digital content and upload it onto the web from my massive video and film library. It's going to be exciting. At least I think so. Uh, let's see what else I got for you now. Talked about his musical career. I think we're going to shift gears now on the show and talk about something else. Um, I think I will take a break. I want to play Rod Stewart's Hot Legs. This is a live version. Just a little bit of it as I take a break and regroup because something fell in the background.
Thank you, Rod Stewart. Great song. Um, can't play the studio version, of course. God, I'm getting texted by. Golly, you just wouldn't believe. Oh my God, I'm on the air. Leave me alone. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, listeners. Um, you wouldn't believe it. So let's see here. Uh, it's time for our a relatively new feature I introduced on the pod blast it's called the Classic Music Video of the Week. And this is someone I've seen in concert who is no longer with us. Let me just set up. I want to play a live version of this particular song. Got it. Um, And reveal what it is and talk about some stats about this music video. This is from the 80s, of course. I'm not just going to focus on the 80s, but I am. I mean, I, it was Joan Jett and the Blackhearts' uh, Do You Want to Touch, the remake of the Gary Glitter song, because that video was shot here in the Atlanta, Georgia area at Six Flags Over Georgia back in 1982 in part. Um, and then I featured uh, Asia, uh, Don't Cry, from their second album. I thought, because that was kind of like a Red is the Lost Ark type video. Well, this one is a Tom Petty song, You Got Lucky. I love the music video to You Got Lucky which was the first single from Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers album, Long After Dark. The song was released on October 22nd, 1982, along with the song Between Two Worlds on the B-side of the 45 single record, which peaked at number 20 on the Billboard Hot 100 and number one on the Billboard Top Tracks chart, where it stayed for three weeks at the end of 1982. Somewhat unusual for a Tom Petty song, guitars give up the spotlight to allow synthesizers to carry the song's main structure. In terms of the music video, Tom Petty felt that the video was a real groundbreaker and stated that he and the band wrote the treatment themselves, borrowing heavily from a post of from a, a, the look of Mad Max 2, a post-apocalyptic world. And Mad Max 2 was released on Christmas Eve in 1981 in Australia and on May 21st, 1982 in movie theaters in the USA. The music video begins with Tom Petty and Mike Campbell happening upon a black tent in front of the Vasquez Rocks which have been seen in many classic television shows like The Outer Limits and Star Trek. That's where Captain Kirk was fighting the Gorn, the reptilian creature in the 19th produced episode, including both pilots of Star Trek Arena. Um, so when they saw this, the video begins with Tom Petty and Mike Campbell happening upon a black tent in front of the Vasquez Rocks after riding in a hover car which is used in the television show Logan's Run, based on the movie of the same name, which had Farrah Fawcett Majors in it. She had a death scene in that movie. But they find a radio and cassette player wrapped in bubble wrap, and they play the tape, which begins the music of You Got Lucky. The other band members, Howie Epstein and Ben Montchench and Stan Lynch, arrive in a sidecar racing motorcycle. Entering the tent, they turn on a bank of cobweb-covered switches that control power for music studio equipment, as well as a bank of television sets, which show the videos for Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers, Here Comes My Girl, and A Woman in Love, It's Not Me. And get this, a clip from the Galactica 1980 episode. We just did a pod blast on Battlestar Galactica the first 45 years. Look it up. It's actually pretty good. It, it didn't get as much of a response on YouTube as my other videos have done. I was surprised, but uh, it's packed with information and interviews and stuff. And But anyway, I'm really surprised because we were bagging on Galactica 1980, but I kind of defended it for a couple things like the flying... Uh, motorcycle cars in the first episode of Galactica 1980 where the Galactica finally found Earth and the attack on the Capitol Records building by the Cylons, which is a simulated attack for demonstration purposes in the scene, but it looked great, even though it combined stock footage from the Universal movie Earthquake. Anyway, in the music video, a clip from, of all things, Galactica 1980, the episode Galactica Dis Discovers Earth Part 1 is playing on one of the televisions. And that elicits... A reaction from Tom Petty, possibly explaining the cause of the destruction 
in the video's universe. As they explore the tent, Campbell finds a hollow body Gretsch 6120 guitar just in time to play the song's guitar solo. Epstein hits the jackpot on a slot machine, causing coins to flow over his hands. Tom Petty overturns an Astro Invader arcade game before they all ride away, leaving behind the cassette player. Remember that video? It was very, very memorable. I loved it because I love Mad Max. Let's listen to a live version of You Got Lucky as we remember that music video. Anyway, here's one you might remember. This is a 1985 performance.
What a great concert Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers threw. I saw them in 2011 in the Atlanta, Georgia area at the Gwinnett Arena with Samantha Livingston. We had a blast. It was incredible. Never forget it. Um, took lots of pictures. Just one of the best concerts I've ever seen, along with the Who. Oh, man, it's just, it just was an epic, epic concert. Item, it's time for the correction corner or clarification corner sometimes. This is also a borderline fake rant of the week for me, but let's go. Now, usually I'd correct a mistake that I made, but this week I'm going to correct a mistake that others made. This first correction is from a television show in 2023. The other is from a television show from 2005 and 1966. I'll explain in just a sec. So... There's a show that I watch every day, weekdays, on my DVR or live that I like a lot. It comes on at 7 in the morning. It's an hour show. And it's called Tune In With Me on MeTV. And that's a one-hour program on the MeTV network nationwide in the USA on that free network. And recently they reran a show that was based on 1980s video games, or at least that was the main topic. They were celebrating 1980s video games and offering some history and some facts about arcade video games and some consoles and things of that nature. And when it first aired, I pointed out on this show, The Nostalgic Pod Blast, that their writers were a tad off in their timelines of when specific video games were first introduced for play in arcades in the U.S., so point number one, tune in with me, the writers, not the host, but the host, the host, Bill Leff, made this claim on air that these two games debuted in 1983, which is not true. Let's start with Centipede, which the script of the show that host Bill Leff, L-E-F-F, he's a radio host and an actor. He's been in um, some movies and some smaller roles, smaller speaking roles, but Bill Leff was reading a script, so I, I don't blame him, but he should have known, because he's older than I am, he stated that Centipede was introduced in 1983. <laughs> Incorrect. The correct debut year was 1980 for the game Centipede, specifically on Saturday, July 26th, 1980. Here's the facts. Centipede was co-designed by Ed Logg, L-O-G-G Logg, and Dona, D-O-N-A, Bailey, in 1980. Atari Centipede is a fixed-shooter arcade game with a trackball that ultimately became one of the most commercially successful titles of the video arcade's golden age. And I know because I lived it. I know it was 1980, and I remember playing it in 1981, so when they said 1983, I was like, no way. Um, I have it in my Atari 5200 console that's in the background for anyone watching on YouTube or on in the Facebook group, the Nostalgic Pod Blast on camera. But right now I have Pac-Man on, on the screen. So next, number two of two of the errors in that particular show on Tune In With Me, <clears throat> salute to the 1980s video games. The host Bill said that Ms. Pac-Man hit the arcade scene in 1983. <laughs> Incorrect. Very close, but no quarter. Yeah, instead of no cigar, yeah, I'm a funny guy. Uh, Miss Pac-Man, the sequel to the 1980 mega-hit Pac-Man, was first distributed to arcades across the USA in early 1982, specifically on Wednesday, January 13th, 1982. Even Richard Dawson talked about his own Miss Pac-Man game that he had in his dressing room in a couple of 1982 episodes of Family Feud, which are airing on the Buzzer National USA Network often. I've seen this particular episode air many times, and it's a 1982 episode without a doubt. Uh, but I remember just from being alive, because I'm an old fart, I remember playing Ms. Pac-Man in 1982. Now, that's a very gri minor gripe of mine. Um, the thing is, I wish I or someone had written the tune in with me staff to let them know that those slight mistakes were made so that they could correct them for a rerun with a dubbing job, like dub over his voice, you know, it's where, even if it doesn't match what the lips are, are saying. Centipede hit in 1980, 1980. and uh, Ms. Pac-Man debuted in 
1982 instead of 1983 for both. But I think they, they the whole segment was talking about 1983, so I don't think they really could have could have edited that unless they uh, reshot it. So again, that's a very minor minor gripe, and and I blame myself because if I had written them or someone else had written them to let them know, let the writers know and the staff know, then perhaps they could have dubbed over that or corrected it. So that's partially my bad, but to the good, because I really like Tune In with Me. That Tune In with Me show airing seven to eight a.m. Monday through Friday on MeTV recently added the Universal Pictures cartoons, including. <laughs> <laughs> Woody Woodpecker and Chili Willy, which I watched in those quarter-operated cartoon vending machine Super 8 millimeter film pay-per-view booth cartoon viewers called the Kitty Rama Cartoon Theater. And Kitty Rama spelled with a K, K K-I-D-D-I-E-R-A-M-A. The Kitty Rama Cartoon Theater that we talked about recently here on the Nostalgic Pod Blast in the Nostalgic Toy of the Week segment. But more good points... About Tune In With Me, Tune is in cartoon, T-O-O-N, with me, are the hosts, especially the comedian performing the hand puppet fish named Toonie the Tuna. And he also portrays funny and strange characters like the cocky president, Teddy Roosevelt. And he does a funny and very odd parody of the, the painter, Bob Ross, the artist, Bob Ross with the afro, white guy with the afro, um... And he, he wears this wig. <laughs> and just, it's strange, man. He's done that a couple times uh, in the recent Tune In With Me hours. And it's hilarious. It cracks me up. That comedian's name is Kevin Fleming. And uh, the main host is a toy collector named Bill Leff. I already mentioned him, I know. Who's also a radio host in the Chicago, Illinois area where Tune In With Me is produced by Weigel, the owners of the MeTV Network. Neil Sabin created the Tune In With Me show, which began airing on January 4th, 2021 on MeTV after a preview on January 1st, 2021. And I like it. I like it. I'm sorry. That was a little tribute to Modern Problems and Chevy Chase. I'm sorry. I busted out my own eardrums and I probably busted out yours too. Oh my gosh. You probably had to turn the volume down. I'm sorry. Now for my next correction. In my Star Trek 57th anniversary tribute edition of The Nostalgic Pod Blast recently, I mentioned the 2005 to 2008 special editions, which are the versions of the classic science fiction original Star Trek series that are currently in rerun syndication streaming on Paramount Plus and airing on the MeTV network once a week on Saturday nights as part of their sci-fi Saturday night lineup. Well... Not only did CBS Paramount back in 2005 through 2008, because they slowly, it took a long time for them to recreate the special effects, but not only did they recreate the special effects, a la George Lucas and his Star Wars, the original trilogy special editions, and I've talked about this before, I know I'm repeating myself for those that heard, heard me say this, but they removed the opening credits, which I hate, of season one, two, and three. Four different versions of the opening credits were removed in place of a newly orchestrated in the 2000s version of the Star Trek theme. I hate that. Well, okay, so they did that. They fixed things they didn't need to fix. And some of the special effects they didn't need to fix. Now, some they did. Most of them they did. I'll give you that. But some of the CGI looked really cheap. I mean, it was done on the cheap, unfortunately. hate to say it. I don't mean to piss anyone off at CBS Paramount, but I'm going to be honest with my audience. The audience is listening. The nostalgic podience audience is called the podience pod like podcast podience is listening and I will never lie to my audience. I just won't. And I always have the facts correct. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. Well, I say if it is broken, do fix it. Well, recently me TV aired the episode, the enemy within where captain Kirk is split into two halves by the ship's transporter, a good half and an evil half. It's a preposterous plot, but it's a good episode with good original music and all that stuff in the background. But the lesson of the episode and the plot in the story is that a person's evil side, properly controlled and disciplined, is crucial to a leader's strength. In the story's climax at the end of Act 4, the evil Kirk freaks out on the bridge, and you see a complete blank white viewing screen. 
No stars, no planets, no nothing. Just like a movie theater screen with no movie playing. Why didn't they fix that? This has not been fixed since 1966. And there was a clear opportunity to fix this in these remastered episodes. And someone really blew it, man. I mean, why wasn't there a supervisor that was a fan? Because there's other things we've talked about before. I don't want to rehash what I talked about on the Star Trek 57th anniversary pod blast. But but there's (coughs) many things they should have fixed um, where there was missing um, voice tracks from, of all people, Ted Cassidy in the, the third episode in production order, the Cobra might maneuver. You now have one minute remaining. You now have one minute. That was it. You now, now have one, one minute. Minute, 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 minute. It was missing. And Sulu reacts to it like he's hearing. It's so awkward if you watch that episode. But I'm, I'm, I'm all over the place with the story. They should have fixed that, too. They could have had a sound-alike voice artist. It sounds like Ted Cassidy has been dead since 1979. Fix that. I just think it's interesting that no one on the restoration team of the original Star Trek noticed that there are no stars or planets on the main viewing screen in Episode 5 of The Enemy Within in production order when they revamped the episode. It's my ship! It's my ship! It's mine! When the evil Kirk is freaking out with Shatner overacting his heart out. It's a great little dramatic moment. So melodramatic. Anyway. Another thing I wanted to add about a previous topic covered here on the show was something about Superman the movie, which we discussed last week in the David McCollum Remembrance and Christopher Reeve Remembrance pod blast for Christopher Reeve's birthday, heavenly birthday. Um, This is on the negative side of things about Superman the movie because I gushed about how much I love it. It is one of my top 10 movies of all time. I don't have it in the background anyway. Um... But I talked about how great it is, and it is great. I love the movie more than dislike it, but there's a couple bad things I didn't talk about. I probably should save it for December 15th, 2023, which will mark the 45th anniversary of the release of Superman the movie in the United States in wide release. But I'm just going to touch on it now. I'm not trying to be negative. I'm just being real with you. There were horrible, bad miniature special effects by an artist named Derek Meddings. This guy's work was so fake in Superman the movie and in other things. He also worked on the 007 James Bond movies, such as Moonraker around the time of the release of Superman the movie, and previously on Jerry Anderson's UFO or UFO television show, which lasted 26 episodes. And I played the opening theme of that here on the Pod Blast. If you're watching on Facebook Live, I bet it gets muted later, but you heard it. Everywhere else you heard it, even on YouTube, I'm sure you heard it. But I have no doubt it'll be it'll be muted by the bots on uh, Facebook after I'm live on that platform. But uh, yeah, I had never really liked Derek Meddings' miniatures compared with uh, Brian Johnson, who worked on Space 1999 and The Empire Strikes Back and Alien and Return of the Jedi, or John Dykstra, who handled the the models and miniatures in Star Wars and Battlestar Galactica. I'm just citing things from that period in time before CGI. Models always look better than CGI to me. Really, I think the best special effects are when you incorporate both in terms of modern 2023, 2024 technology. I think it's great to do both, but use models when you can. Anyway, I'm sorry. I know there's a lot of people that like, just my opinion, that like um, Derek Metting's miniatures, but I always found them fake. But about Superman the movie. He had a model of Air Force One that looked like a child's toy in a shot where Superman supposedly lifting up uh, Air Force One from where an engine was that had burned out and blew up, if you recall. It, there was this one shot. It's so freaking fake. It, it didn't ruin the movie, but it kind of takes you out of the, the grandness of that scene. The only thing that saved it was the music by John Williams. Also, there was a terrible Tinker Toy town. It looked like Tinker Toys, supposedly near the Grand Canyon towards the end of Superman the movie, in which this town is almost flooded when Hoover Dam burst. Remember when the dam burst after the missile exploded in the desert on the San Andreas Fault and caused the earthquake and all that jazz? So someone at Warner Brothers, please do a special edition to fix those awful miniature special effects. That's just bad, bad stuff. Another gripe 
is how dated the Daily Planet set looks. Now, that's not the movie maker's fault. That's just the way things were back in 1977 when Superman the movie was made. So it's a bit of an unfair criticism. But damn, does that place look dated as hell. The clothes, the bell bottoms, the lack of computers, the use of landlines, the dated 1970s expressions like bananas. That said, the three-hour and eight-minute cut of Superman the movie, which is out on Blu-ray since 2017 by Warner Brothers, is my top ten in my top ten favorite movies of all time. I know I'm repeating myself. and I, Someone's complained, you repeat yourself a lot. I'm sorry I do. It's because I have written this myself, and I'll get ahead of myself and just talking off the cuff, say something I have later in my little script. That's what that means. That's why that happens, and that's something I need to improve on. But again, the John Williams music, I'm repeating myself again, covers a lot of the sins in that epic picture, Superman the movie. So what do you think? Do you think I'm being a little too critical of Derek Meddings? I mean, it was a long time ago, 1977, 1978, when the movie was made, but I think his miniatures suck. Always have thought that. I thought his moon base and UFO versus uh, Brian Johnson's moon base in Space 1999 were worlds apart in terms of quality. Derek Maddox is just not a very good miniature artist, and I know a lot of people love him. I'll probably lose some uh, listeners and viewers over that statement. Oh, shucks. Something just fell. I'm not going to lose my temper. I'm going to work on that. When I'm live, sometimes I cuss. And this is, I'm trying to keep this as a family show. My niece and nephew might be listening, for instance. I want to keep this family friendly. Keep my cool. Not, uh, don't want to lose my S-H-I-T. Okay. I finally got recently the latest edition of Remind Magazine. It was in my mailbox. You can see it on camera, and it has a great cover with Elizabeth Montgomery and as Samantha Stevens on Bewitched. And you see uh, the Wicked Witch of the West from The Wizard of Oz, played by Margaret Hamilton. It's a great Halloween-themed issue. Do you want to know how you can get this for only a dollar an issue? You know, by the way, the retail price is $4.99 per issue plus tax if you go to Barnes & Noble or a retail outlet, a bookseller. If you still have one in your in your neighborhood, well, I'm fixing to tell you how's that for a southern expression. I'm fixing to tell you I'm in Atlanta, Georgia. I'm about to tell you and tip you off to a special deal. If you're here listening or watching the Nostalgic Pod Blast, chances are you like nostalgia. Well, this has been around for a while. This monthly magazine I want to tell you about called Remind Magazine, which is loaded with interesting articles, games, full color photos. Interviews to their favorite stars, creators, and personalities, and lots more. Remind Magazine offers fresh takes on popular entertainment from days gone by. Each issue has dozens of brain-teasing puzzles, trivia quizzes, classic comics, and monthly themed features from the 1950s through the 1990s. The best part is, it comes to you in the mail each and every month, and it makes a great birthday gift. God. The gift recipient will think you spent a heck of a lot more than $12. No tax, no shipping. Out the door, 12 bucks for a limited time only. It's an introductory offer for the first year. It's just like the old Dynamite magazine when we were younger. If you're a Gen Xer anyway, or Sports Illustrated. I used to like National Geographic's World magazine. And Remind Magazine is published each and every month. Remember how sometimes magazines would skip months? Mad Magazine would be like nine months out of the year. And then they'd have that double size, super size issue that was just reprints in between those months when they wouldn't have all new content. Not with Remind, baby. Every month you're going to get some action from them. So $12 for a whole year? You can't even get a streaming service for $12 a month. And what can you buy for a dollar anymore? Even the dollar stores are raising their prices and changing the very names of their stores to accommodate no more dollar items. Well, here's how you can order. This is simple. RemindMagazine.com. RemindMagazine.com. Or call toll-free 855-773-6463, and you can order old school over the telephone with a friendly order specialist using your Visa, MasterCard, American Express, or Discover. Or hit up that secure order page at RemindMagazine.com. Phone number 855-773-6463, 855-773-6463. Please mention the Nostalgic Pod Blast 
when you order. That's the name of this show. Thank you. And now back to the program, the Nostalgic Pod Blast. It's time for the old fashioned expression of the week, which also could fall into the TV cliche of the week. And I have a clip of the use of this in just a moment that's going to make you laugh. The expression is, well, I never. I've never heard anyone use that in real life. Have you? Well, I never. This suggests, this suggests that the phrase means, I never would believe such a thing. This phrase goes back to the year 1777. In The School for Scandal, a comedy in five acts written by Richard Brinsley Sheridan. In which there was a line that said, well, I never was so surprised in all my life. Why do people say, well, I never? The definition of, well, I never is this. It's used in speech to express surprise or shock about something. They're getting married? Well, I never. I disagree. I think it's about being offended. Well, I never, sir. Um... Now, apparently, it's a British term, and along with, well, I never did, may be a shortening of an earlier phrase such as, well, I never was so surprised, and I imagine, well, I never heard slash saw such a thing also fits the bill. The first quotation of, well, I never, is from 1836, specifically condensed down to, well, I never But I found an earlier one from December 29th, 1832 in a short story called Quite Beyond Belief by Mrs. George Crookshank. I kid you not, that's the name of the author. Mrs. George Crookshank, published in The Maids, Wives, and Widows, Penny Magazine, and Gazette of Fashion, number 10, volume 1. Clip in a second of the use of this in pop culture. Um... It's a good one, as it's one of the protagonist usual exclamations used several times along with variations such as, well, well, if ever, and, well, did you ever? Or, no, I never. Or, well, it's quite beyond belief. This suggests the phrase means, I never would believe such a thing. Now I'm going to play a clip in a sitcom that we all know and love. I don't know anyone that doesn't like this show. Where you hear the line in a funny... I'm still getting text messages. Oh my God, give me a break. Girl, you you about to get outed if you don't stop. And I don't want to, I don't want to do that. Okay, let me... uh, I swear, when I'm live, I don't pull no friggin' punches. You mess with me, I'm I'm busy! Sorry. <laughs> Let's listen. That totally threw off the flow of my story. Here. Oh, 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 let me get my cue mark. Cue mark. Okay, I gotta get to this specific spot. And you'll recognize the show, this show, that what this is, the, what the show is instantly. Let's listen to the use of, well, I never. Here it is. Excuse me, sir. Perhaps I can be of help to you. The Dormans Convention is downstairs. Uh, perhaps I can be of help to you. The dog catches on his way up. Well, I never. Uh, maybe if you try wearing a mask. <laughs> Sam and the Sun, the great red fox. I've talked about his blue comedy on the show. This, I try to keep this as a family show, and uh, I could, and I hope Julie Summers, oh, she probably didn't tune in, but I hope she didn't hear me. It was one of the shows I was talking about Julie Summers' autographs that she sent me, or sent back to me, that I, stuff I'd mailed to her to ask her to please sign. Towards the end of that show, I played a very raw clip from 1983, uh, comedy in a plain brown wrapper. 
Red Fox, one of my favorite comedy bits of all time from Las Vegas, Nevada. It's hilarious. Vestron Video. I bought this from a, a video store that went out of business. Kids, you know what VHS is? Anybody? I doubt I have any younger listeners. It's all people like me. But, well, I never. That was a great example. Anyway, I just never heard anyone use that in real life. Have you? Let me know in the comments. Now, I was going to show stuff on camera. I guess I can now. I'll try to. I'll show some of them. I want to show some top Star Wars cards. And and then later I want to talk about some Halloween movie picks that you can find that are accessible that you may not know of that you'll be extremely inter- excuse me, entertained by. It's not just the Shining, Halloween that we watch every year and that we love. Nothing wrong with those movies. But I have some more offbeat scary movies for your Halloween 2023 season or Halloween 2024. You might be listening to this in 2025 for all I know. Um, that's the thing. I want this show not to be dated. You know, that's why I, I'm sorry I talked about some sports earlier because that dates the show just for that moment. And then once you get past it, it's not dated again, right? That's why I try not to talk about news and things because, you know, political shows and things like they don't have much replay value. I hate to say it. I hate to say it because I replay stuff. Well, a station that I'm on, Fistful of Radio out of Atlanta, plays things that are dated. So I sound like a hypocrite. But uh, let me play a song by the Tubes. I play this pretty much every, almost every show. So I know you know what it is. Any regulars, regular audience members. But I at least focus, for the viewer, focus on what I'm showing. And listeners, I'm sorry if you're bored. Oh, jeez. Um... I'm dealing with a real asshole right now that's texting me. I'm sorry. Stop. You're being an asshole. <laughs> Don't do that. Don't be a butthole.
So I managed to show all of series one of the, for the viewer listeners. I was showing uh, for the viewers, the blue border series one star Wars tops cards. There were five total series produced. First with the blue, second with the red border, third with the yellow border, fourth with the green border, fifth with the orange border. In the orange series, the fifth and final series of the original cards from 1977, you finally saw the monsters because George Lucas kept the monsters in the cantina under wraps. And, um, and you saw some behind-the-scenes shots, which were interesting, special effects shots and stuff on the set. So I'll show the others later. I might, do, I might go YouTube Live tomorrow um with an abridged version of this show i, I don't want to repeat myself because it'll be a little bit clear and full hd and all that stuff for youtube and maybe get some youtube live interaction with some youtubers out there that don't do facebook in terms of the viewer side of things listeners you're all good this is going to be the audio version i'm not going to put the youtube stuff that i'm going to do tomorrow uh in the audio platforms so I want to thank Samantha Livingston. The first sticker you saw of the of of the uh, Luke Skywalker, it, that is a sticker. That's a sticker version of the first card, and she gave that to me in 1998. I'm old as dirt, and I thank her. I will always thank her for that. So I got to give credit. Credit's due. That was one sticker I had used as a kid that I didn't have. So that was pretty cool uh, back then. Uh, what she did for me there. So always be grateful for that. Getting back to the show. Let's see where we're at. Starting to wind things down. Item. Happy debut day. No clip, but happy debut day to the Twilight Zone, which premiered on CBS on Friday, October 2nd, 1959 at 10 p.m. The anthology show, of course, was hosted by Rod Serling, and it lasted for 156 episodes on CBS, including a fourth season where the show was expanded to a one-hour format. Then the very next season, it returned to a half-hour show in a half-hour time slot in its fifth and final TV season. Um, and in 1993, there was a pinball machine, an awesome pinball machine produced by Bally Midway, based on the show with audio and all sorts of things inside it that was a heck of a lot of fun to play. And in that year, 1993, that was one of three super pinball machines. And what made them super was the wide cabinet. It was wider than your average pinball machine. The others in that year that were wide were the Indiana Jones, the pinball adventure pinball machine, which I own. Uh, a prototype of it's very very rare and very collectible and pretty valuable um because it has steel parts instead of cheaper plastic parts that were used when the game was released to arcades and then star trek the next generation was also a super pin with that wide cabinet the the last two the latter two were made by williams electronics which is affiliated with bally midway by the way um and that was produced in chicago illinois those games I think a pinball game is among the coolest merchandising items that a television show can ever have based upon it. In fact, I think a pinball machine is one of the coolest toys you could ever have or ever play. Whether you own it or play it in an arcade, whatever, it's a toy. A pinball machine is a toy, and it is a game of skill. It really, really is. Eye-hand coordination is put to the test with pinball. That's why I don't like simulated pinball games that are like basically video games. Uh, it's not the same. You can't... You can't shake the machine, try to alter it without tilting. You can you can do that, and it's not cheating. It's part of playing the game, and it's kind of thrilling to try to, you know, prevent the ball from going down the middle without tilting. You know what I'm saying? And I like the pinball games that had that middle that metal piece in the middle of the game, in between the flippers, where if you use the force and didn't look, it might the ball might go down and hit that metal piece with the rubber on it and bounce up. You know. Anyway. <laughs> Uh, get back to the Twilight Zone. So the Twilight Zone ended its original CBS Network primetime run with the final all-new episode airing on Friday, June 19th, 1964, with the episode titled The Bewitchin' Pool. But the last episode to be filmed in production order was titled Come Wander With Me, with Bonnie Beecher as the ghostly woman singing that song. And that one aired on Friday, May 22nd, 1964 on CBS at 9.30 p.m. 
So, item, it's time for the nostalgic toy of the week. And I do have a clip here. It's a 30 second spot of a vintage 1970s commercial for this toy. As I pull it up, I'll tell you a little bit off the cuff. This toy was based on a popular movie. Let's see here. I don't, someone is texting me, and I don't think I had permission to read this on the air, so I'll keep it private. All right, anyway, let me get the clip. And. I want to have this set up and tell you a little bit of what I'm talking about without giving it away. Where are you? Here it is. Here's the clip. Hang on. I thought I had it. Sorry, listeners. Oh, whoa, 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 whoa. Okay, I got it. Based on a movie, we talked earlier about one of the actors in this movie who was in Piranha 3D to give you a a hint. I think you've already figured it out. You're a very smart audience. You're a very intelligent audience, and you know a lot about trivia. We need to all have, like, I wish we all lived in the same town. We could go play team trivia at a local watering hole, you know, and play for money or free drinks or whatever. We'd kill it, wouldn't we? All of us. We'd do so well. But this toy is actually a game. It was released in 1975, the same year that the movie it's based upon was released. The Ideal Toy Company produced this. I guess I'll just play the commercial right now. Jaws. 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 Jaws is the game where you try to fish out what's in the jaws of the great white shark. I'm going for the camera. Made it. But be careful, because if you remove the wrong piece, the jaws will get you. You're out. Jaws, it's you against the great white shark and each other from ideal. Man, I love that game. Of course, the game of Jaws capitalized on the success of the blockbuster Steven Spielberg film that hit theaters on June 20th of that year, 1975. The concept of the game is reminiscent of the scene from the movie where Matt Hooper, played by Richard Dreyfus, the actor who later did Piranha 3D, and Martin Brody, Roy Scheider's character, opened the digestive tract of the deceased shark to recover and discover fish, as expected, and a Louisiana license plate in a tin can. So you fish these objects out with a hook without the jaws busting you <laughs> and snapping on you. Gameplay. The object of the game was to be the first player to remove four pieces of junk from the shark's mouth. In the case of three or four players, or five pieces of junk in the case of a two-player game. Players first loaded the 13 pieces of junk into the shark's mouth. At the beginning of their turn, each player named the piece of junk they were attempting to remove. A plastic gaff hook was used to extract the target. If the player successfully removed it, the piece was kept aside and the next player took their turn. As the junk pieces were removed, the weight distribution in the shark's mouth became unpredictable and could trigger a sudden snap, snap of its jaws. If the jaw snapped shut during a turn, that player was out of the game and had to return their junk back into the shark's mouth. The remaining players then resumed the game. The first player to successfully retrieve the required number of junk pieces won the game. In the box, a complete game included the shark body, which is like a hard plastic, fins, lower jaw, set of teeth, stickers representing the shark's eyes, a gaff hook, rubber bands, and junk. The 13 junk pieces that came with the game were a tire, a camera, a walkie-talkie, a baseball glove, a jug, a pistol, a wagon wheel, an anchor, a lantern, a boot, a bone, a skull, and a fishbone. Printed instructions were included. Man, it should have had a head, like in the movie. <laughs> Not just a skull. The game was seen in a season four episode of The Six Million Dollar Man titled A Bionic Christmas Carol from season four of that show in a scene where Colonel Steve Austin goes Christmas shopping for gifts for three kids that he's watching and taking care of. You see the Jaws toy game with the giant shark that you fish 
objects out of right there on the counter by the cash register in the scene. Now, Jaws was a universal motion picture, and The Six Million Dollar Man was a universal TV series. So Universal plugged their own product. In fact, in that same scene, you see a shot of The Six Million Dollar Man action figure by Kenner Toys in the background when they're shopping for toys. And there's a close-up shot of the toy in that scene as the act goes to commercial break. That episode aired on Sunday, December 12th, 1976, after that toy had been out for about a year or so on ABC TV with guest star Little Adam Rich, mere weeks before the debut of Eight is Enough on that same network, ABC, on, which debuted on Tuesday, March 15th, 1977. By the way, the same night that Three's Company premiered on that network. And Adam Rich, of course, passed away from a drug overdose, and he played little Nicholas Bradford, God rest his soul, with a little bowl cut. He was a cute kid actor, child actor. So, um, I have another toy. This is a new toy, a brand new toy that has a nostalgic bent to it. The new toy is based on Stevie Nicks. It's the Stevie Nicks Barbie doll cocaine not included i'm kidding i'm kidding i'm kidding from mattel's website barbie celebrates the iconic queen of rock and roll stevie nicks with a barbie doll in her likeness nicks achieved worldwide success with the band fleetwood mac before embarking on a critically acclaimed chart-topping solo career known for her captivating stage presence and signature style she has left an indelible imprint on artists and fans around the world. Stevie Nicks music series Barbie Doll wears a beguiling black dress inspired by the legendary Rumors album cover and holds her iconic tambourine. It includes a doll stand and certificate of authenticity. Barbie Doll cannot stand alone. I don't know, that's weird. It says Barbie doll cannot stand alone, period. End of sentence. Barbie doll cannot stand alone. Okay. Colors and decorations may vary. The actual retail price of the Stevie Nicks Barbie doll, not including cocaine, is $55 plus shipping and taxes. Now, I kid and I joke, but a drug addiction is no laughing matter. It really isn't. Um... And if you have a drug addiction, you should get help. Absolutely. Uh, because a drug addict, the only thing that's going to happen to you is you're going to go to jail or wind up dead if you don't get help. If you're on serious drugs like that, like heroin, cocaine. Got a quote from an interview Stevie Nicks did for Yahoo Music in an article published on January 16th back in 2015. Quote, all of us are drug addicts, but there was a point where I was the worst drug addict. Unquote. She says about the mid-1980s when her addiction had peaked. Quote, I was a girl. I was fragile. And I was doing a lot of coke. And I had a hole in my nose. So it was dangerous. Unquote. The hole in Stevie Nicks' nose came from a self-medication misstep where she began to treat her migraines with a solution of aspirin and water. That she squirted up her nose. Quote. I thought I was being the best, most hygienic nurse ever. Unquote, she says. No joke. I mean, it sounds like I'm, I'm not trying to make light of that. But I also heard her in, a, in an interview, I think, with Larry King say that she snorted cocaine that caused the hole in her nose. So, And that was before 2015. So I, I don't know what to believe. But it, it's her being quoted in both instances. And I saw her say it was the cocaine that put a hole through my nose. I guess you put a ring in it. God, horrible thought. Item. Here at this show, you're listening to or watching the nostalgic pod blast. I try to dispel and I love to dispel as many falsehoods as I can that I find on the interweb. Already we have discussed the internet lie that Farrah Fawcett sold more wall posters in history <laughs> Not so. Heather Thomas did from The Fall Guy and Zapped, as she said herself on this very show, The Nostalgic Pod Blast. This time, though, we turn our attention towards the most interesting man in the world. 
Dos Equias, be a pitchman, former pitchman. I guess he's no longer the, the current pitchman of that product. So that we're going to call this an, a relatively new segment I like to call Dispelling Another Internet Rumor Department. I report to you now that the most interesting man in the world, beer pitchman Jonathan Goldsmith, was never on classic Star Trek. William Shatner tweeted that he was. The rumor stemmed from a tweet on October 1st, 2017 from William Shatner himself where he tweeted, quote, You do know that the man, I effed it up, you do know that this man played a red shirt. Take three, as we're live, <laughs> from William Shatner's Twitter account on October 1st, 2017. You do know that this man played a red-shirted ensign on my show, question mark. And he had a picture of the most interesting man in the world, actor Jonathan Goldsmith, from a Dulce Equius print ad. Well, actually, that's not the case, sir. Here's an article from way back on Monday, November 13th, 2017. I always thought he did. I always thought the episode in question is the third episode we've talked about earlier tonight, the Corbomite maneuver of the original Star Trek run which is episode three in production order after the two pilots. It's the first regular hour episode ever filmed for the classic Star Trek. So here's a little Star Trek fact check for you. The most interesting article in the world is what the title of this article is. In the age of social media and pop culture related clickbait, this story has been shared and retold many times. Mr. Shatner's tweet is only the most recent example. Lauren Davis offered this variation of the tale in 2012. And in question is, was Jonathan Goldsmith an extra in a red shirt in a hallway scene in that episode, The Corbomite Maneuver? So at the time, he was the most interesting man in the world in several print ads for Dos Equius Beer. You, you know, that everybody knows that. Or, you know, he was, he was a booze salesman. Um... And people were reporting that he appeared on screen in Star Trek, but he doesn't have a death scene. Well, as I said, I'm repeating myself because I, I went off the cuff. The Corbin Light Maneuver was the third episode of classic Star Trek to be filmed, but it was the 10th to air in the air date order. Which, by the way, MeTV and Paramount Plus go by, which irritates me to no end. It was always released on VHS. In production order. It was released on Laserdisc in production order. It was released on DVD initially in production order. I don't know where throughout history it, it diverted to aired order, which is a flawed way to watch any show. And the aired order is dictated by when special effects are completed, et cetera, et cetera. Post-production is completed or when the network decides to air the episode. Sometimes they pull various episodes as the season premiere, as was the case in season two of Star Trek with the mock time where we meet Spock's wife. It, but it was episode 34. Episode 30 was the first episode to air of season two of Star Trek, but I digress. Um, maybe I should cut this article short. The, the bottom line is, I'm going to read a quote from the actor himself. He says, no, I was never in Star Trek. That's just a rumor. So, um, but back in 1966, Jonathan Goldsmith was a working actor, but he had lines. He wasn't an extra. He was, he was a credited actor appearing on episodic television. So, Jonathan Goldsmith himself said in 2013 on Reddit AMA, Goldsmith offered a cheeky denial that he ever appeared on Star Trek. Jonathan Goldsmith, quote, let me set the record straight. I have never appeared on Star Trek. If I remember correctly, that is, which is always dubious. In a later interview with the Television Academy, Mr. Goldsmith dismissed the story again, this time with less ambiguity. He was being interviewed by David M. Guterres. It's fitting you're being sent to Mars considering you're credited as being a red shirt in the original Star Trek. Jonathan Goldsmith, no, I wasn't. I've never done that show. I can't convince the fans of that. They keep sending me pictures of a guy in a red shirt, but it ain't me. End quote. Now, I'm going to just stop it right there because I, I there's a lot more in this article and there's proof. And, and we, the origin 
comes from B. Joe, B, B. Joe Trimble, who is a classic Trekkie from the 60s. She wrote a book, The Star Trek Concordance. She's written several books on the good ship Enterprise. And she had gotten some incorrect information from a call sheet. Um, and the, the origin is he had auditioned to play a character played by an, anthro, an, uh, an actor named Anthony Call, uh, who was a credited role. He was a, a guy on the bridge that panicked. Um, anyway, anyone, some of you out there know what I'm talking about. It's blocking the way! It was like a little cube with different uh, colors. It's like a pre Rubik's Cube. It looked like a little piece of a Rubik's Cube, actually, that special effect. Um, that was another special effect. It looked good, the original. They didn't need to redo that for the remastered Star Trek. Anyway, we'll cut it there, um, that story. Item. <clears throat> he wasn't in Star Trek, okay? And... Excuse me. Um, <coughs> I have a fun fact for you. Fun fact of the week. Let's go back to the 1960s again. As of April 1965, there were 3,210,000 homes that had a color television set. Just two years later, it jumped to 10,390,000 households that were equipped with a color TV receiver. The source of that is this book, The 12 O'Clock High Log Book, which is a book about the movie and the TV show, 12 O'Clock High. And the TV show was a Quinn Martin production, which debuted in the fall of 1964, lasting three seasons, including a third and final season, which was the only season in full color. Now, I, a member of a great Facebook group called Classic Television Shows, he had commented on something I posted about when I posted about this. The next topic, the only color episode of the original Perry Mason television show. And he stated that about the color TVs, and I thought that was an interesting fact. I'm not going to say his name because I didn't ask him, can I mention your name on the show? So I'm going to respect the man's privacy. But the source was my post on classic television shows, which has like, I don't know, half of maybe 300, 400, 400,000 members and counting on Facebook. It's a great, great uh, Facebook group, classic television shows. Check it out. So that leads into and segues into my next item. And as I said, only one episode of the original Perry Mason was filmed in color, which aired on CBS at 9 p.m. back on Sunday, February 27th, 1966. That was episode number 262 out of 271 total episodes of the original Perry Mason. Season 9, episode 21 specifically. The reason this sole episode was produced in color was because William Paley... P-A-L-E-Y is how you spell his last name, who was the president of CBS at the time, commissioned one color episode of Perry Mason to be filmed so he could see what the show would look like in color should the show be renewed for a 10th year, which it never was. And that would have been the 1966 to 1967 season when all primetime shows on all networks were produced in color for the fall of 1966. So, it looks weird in reruns. You're watching a black and white show for nine years, nine seasons worth of shows, and then there's a color, and then it's black, back to black and white. Very bizarre. But that's the reason. So, um, oh, it's time for the TV cliche of the week, and I have to get this clip loaded for you in my clip, in my clip machine. This is a good one, I think. And let me... the song and when you hear this song i guess i'll play the whole song because i need to rest my voice and take a break it's starting to crack um this is a live version of this of a great classic song by the electric light orchestra tv cliche of the week here's a clue
a dream. Did you guess what the TV cliche of the week could be? It certainly does pertain to a telephone line. Specifically stalling for time as the FBI or the cops tap a land telephone line in order to trace the location of the caller. He's in the house! The caller is in your house! When a Stranger Calls. Remember that horror movie? Well, by the way, that kind of drama where someone's in the house making spooky phone calls was first seen in, of all movies, an R-rated Christmas movie from 1974 called Black Christmas with Olivia Hussey and Margot Kidder, among others, in the cast. And that was years before When a Stranger Calls starring Carol Kane. But getting back to the... the TV cliche part of it, man, I saw it on The Fall Guy, seen it in Matlock, and a hundred of other television shows and TV movies in between. Usually when a kidnapper calls to demand ransom or make demands. Hell, even in Star Trek, uh, Captain Kirk would say, Scotty, can you get a fix on this communicator? Basically, he didn't say on the communicator, but can you get a fix on this, triangulate this position? But um, 
It's kind of a thing of the past now that most people, even my dad, they have a cell phone, which you can just ping the tower that the phone is using for service, and you can even locate the phone itself to triangulate the location of the caller, which must really cramp the style of folks in the kidnapping and extortion business these days. Mm -mm -mm. Well, I want to play a little bit of the trailer to Black Christmas which is a good spooky movie to watch during this Halloween season. And I want to talk about a few others, too, that are great, that are finally out on Blu-ray. And if you don't have a way to play Blu-rays, just use an Xbox. Use something. Go to Goodwill or just order from eBay. I mean, Blu-ray players are cheap. I would get a Blu-ray player because a Blu-ray player will play a DVD. I mean, that's common knowledge. It will play a DVD, and it will enhance the quality visually of the DVD a little bit. Um, F4K, because I think it looks a little too perfect. I think 1080p is, is just perfect. That's at least that's my opinion. Um, I love it. But let's listen to how Black Christmas, the trailer sounded. It's really spooky. John Saxon is in the cast also. Great character actor. He he died not too long ago, unfortunately. Margot Kidder has a wicked death scene in this movie. Oh, I'm spoiling it. Sorry, you haven't seen. It's so creepy. I mean, like. I could never see Silent Night, Deadly Night, because I don't like to think about Santa Claus being an axe murderer. I never saw it, you know. My friends did when, in the 80s and stuff and rented it. I never did, uh, um, what was the movie where real people died? I never watched those. That's just too much. Uh, Faces of Death. Never, never got into that. But uh, I just think this really up there with supernatural thrillers like The Omen or The Exorcist, uh, that really gets to the core of uh, your fears, you know. So this is creepy hearing people getting killed. Even the audio is creepy uh, while, uh, you know, Silent Night's playing. I ain't gonna say what they're showing. <laughs> this creepy image right now. Damn. Before when a stranger calls, folks. A high school girl's been murdered. Mr. Harrison's daughter is missing. And now at the house where she lives, the other girls are getting obscene phone calls. Yeah, what I've done is I've tapped this phone so that when it rings, it'll ring at the station house, too. Tap, see? There was a little girl murdered over in the park tonight. Yes, I heard.
very scary movie. Black Christmas, 1974. It's about college students who are being terrorized. Remember those idyllic scenes out of your childhood? Crisp winter nights, star bright, sleigh bells, crackling yule logs, candlelight glistening off of shimmering Christmas trees, chestnuts roasting over open fires, carolers beneath snow-covered window ledges. Remember those. Remember them well. After Black Christmas, they'll never be the same again. Black Christmas, starring Olivia Hussey, Keir Dulay, Margot Kidder, and starring John Saxon as Lieutenant Fuller. If this movie doesn't make your skin crawl, it's on too tight. <laughs> okay. Now I'm going to play a shorter clip from When a Stranger Calls so you can compare. Same concept. We're talking about the, the cliche of tapping a phone line to find out where the assailant is. On a warm September evening, Dr. Marcus? Jill Johnson was babysitting for the two young children of a wealthy doctor. Okay. Bye. They told her where they would be and when they would be home. They told her everything she had to know, except what to do when a stranger calls. Hello? Hello, could you get me the police? Well, there's nothing you can do about it down here. Uh, have you checked the children? He's watching me through the windows. Well, if he calls again, we can try to trace it. Why haven't you checked the children? Please, can't you help me? I'm all alone here. What do you want? Your blood. And the terror just begins when a stranger calls. By the way, you can call me. It's right now as we're live. It's almost four in the morning, so nobody's up. 770-438-1050. If you want to call in and talk about anything we got going on tonight. So it's time to move on to the fake rant of the week. In between shows of the Nostalgic Pod Blast, I post articles and an occasional meme about nostalgia in the, the Nostalgic, Nostalgic Pod Blast Facebook, Facebook group. group. So recently I posted a meme of something I've joked about a couple of times here on the show about my uncle Jesse was a moonshiner played by Denver Pyle on the Dukes of Hazard. The other uncle Jesse was a babysitter from Full House played by John Stamos. I'm paraphrasing, but, you know, because it's a visual thing. But that's what it's about, because I've always said that, look, I'm a Gen Xer, so my Uncle Jesse was a guy that made Moonshine on the Dukes of Hazzard. Because um, there's two Uncle, Uncle Jesses. And, hey, I like both of them. There's not an, an either or, you know, in my mind anyway. Well, someone responded, okay, okay. boomer. To that, I say, go boom yourself. I'm a Gen Xer, and I like both of those Uncle Jesse's. It was just a joke. God. Go boom yourself, mother blanker. All right, so another rant I have is actually very real. Spam email. Man, it's on the rise, and it's really irritating. And the same thing with the emergency broadcast system mandated weekly tests. Which are not needed. And it interrupts your DVR recordings. It it cuts off all channels. For those like me. Who are still using TV cable services. I can't cut the cord. Not just yet. Because of this show and for other reasons. But uh, just such an irritant. It's so stupid. I mean when do they ever activate that system? Why do they have to test it every single week? This is a required weekly test of the emergency broadcast system. 
and it'll list all these counties that it's going on in. Oh, it just pisses me off. It's so unnecessary. It's just red tape bull crap. Mm, mm, mm. Well, now we're going to move on as we start to finally wind down the show. I've gone over three hours. God, I tried not to do this, and uh, but I did. I just wrote too much. Um, this is one of our regular segments. It's time for birthdays. Just a few. Gotta say, happy 81st birthday to Britt Eklund, who was born on Tuesday, October 6th, 1942, in Stockholm, Sweden. Britt Eklund was in the second $6 million man movie of the week titled Wine, Women, in War, which aired on Saturday, October 20th, 1973, 50 years ago. She did that just a few months before she became a Bond girl in The Man with the Golden Gun, the second Roger Moore James Bond film as Agent Mary Goodnight. Britt Eklund was also in a 1974 horror movie, The Wicker Man in which she's nude in it and i have it on blu-ray that's one of my recommendations if you haven't seen it for a halloween season movie and brit eklund was once rod stewart's main squeeze after being mrs peter sellers in spectacle so in the pink panther movies among many other films now speaking of peter sellers I want to mention that uh, he married a woman in 1977 who was beautiful, who remained his wife until he died in 1980. Her name is Lynn Frederick. She was with him until a heart attack took his life at the age of 54 on Thursday, July 24th, 1980. Now, she had a tragic end herself, an untimely end, as Lynn Frederick. Look her up. Lynn, L-Y-N-N-E. Frederick, F-R-E-D-E-R-I-C-K, Lynn Frederick. She passed away at the age of 39. Also on the 24th day of a month, on Sunday, April 24th, 1994, allegedly from booze. And as I just said, Peter Sellers died on July 24th, 1980. Now, foul play and suicide were ruled out in Lynn Frederick's death and an autopsy failed to determine the cause of death. She was just stunning. And she was in a Space 1999. I know I mentioned that show too much, but I just love it. She was in a Space 1999 Season 2 episode titled A Matter of Balance, which is on 2B TV for free. I think it runs on Me TV Plus, too. Space 1999 does presently. And she played a character named Charmaine, not to be confused with the toilet paper brand Charmin. Charmaine was her character name. Rest in peace to all those talents. And, and, and happy birthday to Britt Eklund, who's still with us. I'll show on camera later the Wicker Man uh, Blu-ray cover. Let's see who else we have now. That, that was October 6th. We're beyond October 6th. But uh, I am going to find some other birthdays of note. We've talked a lot about Elizabeth Shue. She also was born October 6th, 1963. She's 60 now. Uh, here, I'm going to play the music so you have something to listen to while I just struggle here to look at the list. I, should, I didn't prepare this part in pre-show prep. Ellen Travolta. John Travolta's sister. She was born in 1940 in Englewood, New Jersey. She used to do a lot of acting in sitcoms when her brother, John, was uh, really becoming a big star, starting with uh, on television's Welcome Back, Cotter. So moving on, as we're live, it's now October 7th, 2023. So let's talk about some October 7th birthdays. I only really talk about people that are in movies, music, or television that are, I'm not going to mention Simon Cowell, but I guess I just did. I mean, I have nothing against him. It's just I don't consider him nostalgic. 
I just don't. Maybe you do. Depends on your age, I suppose, because American Idol's been around since 2002, I think. John Mellencamp, happy birthday to you, sir. Born in 1951 in Seymour, Indiana on October 7th, 1951. Jack and Diane, that's my favorite song that was a hit of his. And the Little Pink Houses, I like that one too. Let's see here, who else we got in the list? June Allison, you know, she was an actress, but I knew her from like selling like uh, diapers, basically adult diapers. Uh, What do they call that product? I know it's in the back of my mind. It doesn't matter. Let's move on. Let's move on. It's not a pleasant thing to talk about. Um, There's not a whole lot in my world that I think is noteworthy. So far, I'm looking at my list up for October 7th. So let's move on to October 8th birthdays. Just not seeing anyone I give a crap about. No offense. All right, so we will move on to October 8th birthdays. I'm going to go through October 9th tonight. Because I never know when someone's going to listen to this show. And if it's in October, I want it not to be too far away from the date you're listening. I will acknowledge Bruno Mars. He's more recent. I like his music a lot. He was born in 1985 on October 8th, 1985 in Honolulu, Hawaii. Matt Damon was born in 1970 in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Happy birthday to him. October 8th, 1970. Sigourney Weaver. Oh, yeah. Born... In 1949, October 8th, 1949, in Manhattan, New York, of course, Alien, Aliens, oh, God, so many movies I really like that she did. Galaxy Quest, the comedy. Ah, Paul Hogan, now that's a knife, the Australian actor from Sydney, Australia. He was born October 8th, 1939, in Sydney, Australia, Crocodile Dundee. Chevy Chase. Gotta love Chevy Chase. He was born in Lower Manhattan, New York, October 8th, 1943. He was Saturday Night Live's first breakout movie star. He was only on the first year. And then he came back, you know, he he did guest spots and things. But, yeah, he quit after that first year. Man, I'm hearing some feedback. Squeaky feedback. Um... Oh, yeah, the Ramones. Johnny Ramone, October 8th, 1948, born in Queens, New York. He passed away September 15th, 2004. Happy heavenly birthday to you. Uh, no, 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 no. Good one there. Oh, shoot, I keep running out of music. Let's move on to October 9th. And I need to get back to music history, too. Not tonight. All right, October 9th, Sharon Osbourne. Jackson Brown. Oh, I love Running on Empty. I love that song. I heard him, I saw him in concert, Chastain Park, here in the Atlanta, Georgia area. Not too long ago, you know, rel- relatively recently, and he put on a great concert. Really enjoy his music. Uh... The great John Lennon. Oh, my God. John Lennon gunned down in 1980 on December 8th, but he was born on October 9th, 1940 in Liverpool, England. What a poet. Golly. That was terrible when that happened. And Howard Cosell, of all people, announced on Monday Night Football that John Lennon was gone. That's terrible. Um, Jackson Brown was born in Germany, actually, in 1948 in Heidelberg, Germany. Happy birthday to him. I like his music a lot. Um, I think he's underrated. Scott Bakula was born in St. Louis, Missouri in 1954 on October 9th. He's one of the Star Trek captains. Brandon Routh, born in 1979, one of the Superman actors from Superman Returns in 2006. He was born October 9th, and he was in Superman Returns. That's the role he's best known as, as starring in, or performing. 
acting and whatever. John O'Hurley, who was a Family Feud host right before Steve Harvey took over, and he was, of course, Elaine's boss on Seinfeld. He was born in Maine, Kittery, Maine, in 1954, October 9th, 1954. Happy birthday. I love his voice. He's a great host. Um, Sean Lennon, happy birthday to you. Wow. Born in 1975. I didn't know that. He shared the same birthday as John Lennon. Wow. Dad. Born in New York, New York on October 9th, 1975. Oh, Brian Blessed. He was best known as the Hawkman in Flash Gordon, the 1980 movie. And he was in, his voice was, anyway, in uh, 1999 Star Wars Episode One: The Phantom Menace. He was the alien. He goes, we do not care about the Naboo. We do not care about the Naboo. We do not care about the Naboo. And he was in Space 1999 twice in season one. And then season two, he was an entirely different character. He was Maya's father, Mentor, who blew up when the planet Psycon exploded. Happy birthday to you, sir. Did I say where he was born? 1936 in Yorkshire, England. October 9th, 1936. He's so funny. Um, really good actor. British actor. Oh, shoot. My music. Um, and the show's almost over. Got my little quiz, and then the show's over. Finally, I'm approaching the four-hour mark. It's getting ridiculous. <coughs> Excuse me. I'm gonna now look at October 10th. I know I said I go through the ninth. I'm gonna go through October 10th birthdays. David Lee Roth, Diamond Dave. God, he's on the list. So we got we got to talk about some of these folks here. And the Nostalgic Pop Blast Facebook group, I try not to have it be like the birthday show. My buddy does a much better job than I. Retrozest. Retrozest podcast and Retrozest on Facebook. Look it up. He's got 30-some thousand, 35,000 strong members. And he acknowledges the birthdays of musicians, actors, actresses, uh, the anniversaries of record album releases. Um. He does a great job with that. And he, he recognizes everybody in pop culture land. I don't. I just, I, I pick and choose a few, you know, I can't talk about everybody. I don't want to be the birthday show. He does it better than me because he does, he has Photoshop. I don't, so he does. He does, he takes it to another level. Um, I'm more of a writer, you know. I come up with obscure facts and I'll have a picture. You, If I can, it's from my collection. So it's a unique photograph. But I do find things on the web, obviously. Anyway. Who cares about me? Brett Favre. Happy birthday to you. Born uh, on October 10th, 1969 in Gulfport, Mississippi. I thought he was funny, and there's something about Mary. He did a little bit of acting and some comedic roles, as well as being, of course, a quarterback for Green Bay. Green Bay, Wisconsin. Cheeseheads. Um, Mario Lopez. A lot of people like him. This is nostalgic. Um, a show I didn't care for or watched. I can't say I didn't care for it because I never really watched it. Saved by the Bell on NBC Saturday morning lineup there uh he was born in 1973 october 10th 1973 in san diego california so happy birthday to him he's still around of course he does uh, reporting and you know entertainment journalism one of my talk shows returned on october 9th the talk on cbs uh i like some of the personalities jerry o'connell is one of the personalities from piranha 3d that we talked about earlier um he does a uh, pretty good job on that show he's pretty funny and uh cheryl i like cheryl a lot uh the comedian um cheryl underwood i enjoy her on that show i think she's hilarious all right david lee roth happy birthday to him he was born in bloomington indiana on october 10th 1954 the year of that honeymooner song that i played one of these days one of these days pal right in the kisser Mm. Happy birthday to Tanya Tucker, singer-songwriter, born October 10th, 1958, in Seminole, Texas. I've got to save some of these for, I'm going to do another show on October 
13th, which is a Friday, with uh, some guests we'll talk about later. Helen Hayes, have a happy heavenly birthday to her. She died in 1993 on March 17th, 1993, but she was born on October 10th, 1900 in Washington, D.C. Ben Vereen, happy birthday to Ben Vereen, October 10th, 1946 in Laurenburg, North Carolina. Happy birthday to you. Mm-mm-mm. Happy birthday to you. Ed Wood, the legendary filmmaker. Happy heavenly birthday to him. He's been gone since December 10th, 1978. Pull the string! Well, that was Bela Lugosi, but <laughs> and Martin Landau's interpretation of Bela Lugosi won him an Oscar for Ed Wood. Oh, man. Directed by Tim Burton. Uh, Johnny Depp starred in that movie. Loved it. But the real Ed Wood was born October 10th, 1924 in New York. In Poughkeepsie. I know I'm mispronouncing that. Sorry, New Yorkers. New York Staters. Uh... Usually towards the bottom of the list are the people I care about the most. So I'm just trying to... I, I stop at Dana Elkar. Happy Heavenly Birthday to him, born October 10th, 1927 in Ferndale, Michigan. He passed away on June 6th, 2005. Good character actor there, Dana Elkar. He was on The Six Million Dollar Man, talked about that show earlier. All right, I'm going to stop with birthdays and try to wind down the show. I know I always say that, and then I go another half hour or so. Oh, geez, I didn't do this yet? I gotta save my Halloween jokes for next time. It's finally time for the nostalgic treat of the week. Why am I playing my birthdays? We're moving on. We're moving on. And this is gonna have a Halloween season flair. It will the next couple shows what I feature. But this time the nostalgic treat of the week. Gotta talk about it. Usually we talk about some good or nasty throwback foods from the 1970s or 1980s that you can't find anymore. Usually it's a confection that you can't find anymore. But this time I have a treat for you that is pure sugar, which you can find about three months out of the year. I'm talking about candy corn. Did you know that candy corn was originally called chicken feed? That was the original name of candy corn, which was first invented in the 1880s by a Wonderlay Candy Company employee, George Renninger. That candy company, and it's spelled W-U-N-D-E-R-L-E, one Wonderlay, I'm going to say, I hope that's what how you say it, Wonderlay Candy Company, was the first to produce candy corn in 1888. The Golitz Confection—it's hard. I want to just spell it out because Golitz is spelled G-O-E-L-I-T-Z. The Golitz Conf- Confectionery Company, now called Jelly Belly, that's easier to pronounce, began manufacturing candy corn in 1898. While Jelly Belly still makes candy corn, the largest manufacturer of candy corn is Brock's. Confections, owned by the Ferrara Candy Company. That's my brand. Brock's. Brock's makes approximately 7 billion billion pieces of candy corn per year and possesses 85% of the total share of the candy corn industry during the Halloween season. I have a question for you. Which end is up in the candy corn piece? Because if you're thinking of it as a kernel of corn, like corn on the cob, it don't look right. It doesn't look right. It does not look right. Now, another associated memory of Brock's. Remember the grocery store unattended Brock's candy stand? They had an honor system in the 1970s and 1980s, as I recall. And back then, you'd put change into a cash box or a jar. It'd be about five cents per sample. You'd load up a paper sack like it's Halloween <coughs> to be weighed in some cases. It's okay if you cheated. <laughs> I know I did. Um, but there's so many memorable flavors. The caramel, the orange slice, the butterscotch, uh, the cinnamon, which is like a butterscotch hard disc, but it was cinnamon. Um, I love the Brock's or the Kraft, pr- primarily the Brock's 
caramel square pieces that were wrapped in plastic. I'd melt those things and put them on an apple. <laughs> Make like a caramel covered apple. But you know what? It's two, two, two nostalgic treats in one show because I'm going to talk about certs really briefly. Certs. Now, you can't find these anymore. They were a nostalgic breath mint that were banned in the USA by the U.S. Congress in 2018. Certs were the first breath slash candy mint to be nationally marketed in the United States. Everyone's grandma had certs in her purse, right? I've heard that from multiple people. Oh, my grandma had certs in her purse every time. I know it's nostalgic and great. But certs had been a fixture at American drug, grocery, and convenience stores since its debut on the market back in 1956. It was discontinued in 2018, as I said, possibly for having partially hydrogenated cottonseed oil, which is not allowed as an ingredient in food sold in the USA. Why all of a sudden was it a problem? It always had that in there. Remember the special ingredient? The Retsin crystal, spelled R-E-T-S-Y-N. Retsin. It's two, two, two mints and one. So those are your two nostalgic treats of the week, candy corn and search breath mints. And I like the uh, the peppermint and the fruit-flavored cert. Those were my jam. Item. i got to talk briefly about the North Georgia State Fair. Where I live in the Marietta, Georgia area, it's every late September for about two weeks. Actually, for two weeks. And I attend every year. And uh, I must say, no hubris intended, I made an award-winning quality video. On a 13 minute long ride in the sky bucket. No credit to me. Let me explain. I was just lucky at what I captured in this video. And I was just using an iPhone. And it's like you're riding the sky bucket. The full 13 minute ride. Off the ground and back onto the ground on the other side. And you see a lot in this video. I'm proud of it. But there is like a little green. I don't know if it's the lighting. Because I did this at night. On the very last night. October 1st, 2023 of the North Georgia State Fair 2023. And there's like a little green, it's not too distracting, but it, it, there's like a little green dot that comes and goes. It's bizarre. I don't know if it was feedback from the lighting or what the heck was going on. But it's still a great video from what I captured, not talking about me. And I don't talk in it. I want you to feel like you're on that ride. You can hear the screams of people on various rides, and you see it all, my friends. Check it out. And I posted part one where I'm going from the south end to the north end, um, on the ride, the one-way ride, on the Nostalgic Pod Blast Facebook group. It's right there in HD. It's not 4K. It's HD, but it's clear enough, and you can see all the lovely details. I thought it was great because you feel like you're there. And then in my other YouTube channel, I show the ride coming back, and that YouTube channel is Chance Acting Demo, all one word, Chance Acting Demo. And I posted both of them on that channel as well. Uh, the 13 minute going and I got half coming back. Here's what happened. I tried to go live on Facebook and Facebook wouldn't connect. It would count down three, two, one. It would stay at one. So I shut my phone off right when it was my turn to get on the ride and they keep that thing moving. So I couldn't stand aside and say, can you wait a second? No, you got to get on that thing. So I turned my phone back on. And as you know, with an iPhone, it takes a while for it to reactivate. So I missed half of the way going back, but at least I did catch, get, catch the shot of the big sign, the North Georgia State Fair. Anyway, there's all sorts of great food there. There's an authentic Mexican taco stand, the best tacos I ever had. Tamales went Friday and Sunday that final week. Had a blast. And they have deals. They have a roller coaster. Just please look at that video if you want to. It's a lot of fun. Um, if you like the sky bucket at night, it's killer. It's killer. You see everything. And uh, the North Georgia State Fair is held at Jim Miller Park in Marietta, Georgia. Do you have a state fair in your area? Comment and let me know. And it's okay if you say, you know, a lot of people comment negative things. I do, too. You know, say, eh, I didn't care for candy corn. I got a lot of that backing up on candy corn. A lot of people said, I hate candy corn. It's like circus peanuts. I'm surprised at how many people do not like candy corn. It is pure sugar. Everything in moderation, my friends. My friends! Moderation is key. Um, and, and like I say, I pack a lot into the pod blast. You get more information here in one show than you get in most shows in a whole month. And that's true. That's absolutely true. Cause I listen to a lot of stuff and, uh, I give you more info than anybody <laughs> that I know of. Nothing wrong with them. So now it's time 
for the game. I have six questions. The sixth one I should say for a future topic, but I'm going to go ahead and give them to you now. This is interactive. I want you to think, think, think um, about what this is. This is our game. I'm trying to find the clip. I get a little clip of this. I want to play. Listen, listen to this as we start our game. War games, shall we play a game? Yeah, we're going to play a game. It's called Taglines. I haven't done this in a while. Um, where I name a tagline and you think of the product as an advertising tagline in a print ad or a television ad or a radio ad, whatever. I And these are pretty easy. I came up with some easy ones. You're an educated audience. The audience is very intelligent, but I, I have some basic ones um, this time. These are easy, but not everyone may know them, so let's just do it. These are taglines for snacks, junk food, or candy. And don't let me forget, I want to talk about a cup, just a couple movie recommendations for the Halloween season, and I have something for Steve Russo um, I want to show. The Planet of the Apes TV DVD set. He was He's a friend of the show. He runs a great Facebook group. The fun, fun world of classic television. He has specific dates. I think he cuts it off at 1982. Anyway, I want to share that on camera because I know he watches the show. He's probably asleep right now, but I promise. Anyway, get into the game. Taglines for snacks, junk food, or candy. Tagline. Question one of six. This is so easy, folks. You can't eat just one. The Lay's Potato Chips chance? Yes. Lay's Potato Chips. Question number two. The Fresh Maker. That might be a little more difficult. The Fresh Maker. This candy's big in Europe, but also here too, but more so in Europe. It's chewy. It's minty. They have a fruit variety of it. You eat it. It's not gum. It's not bubble gum, but you do chew it. I guess you chew everything we consume, my goodness, for goodness sakes, in a solid form. That's a solid form. But the fresh maker. Those were Mentos. Mentos. Here's another easy one. Question three. Tagline. Once you pop, you can't stop. Once you, Once pop, you pop, you can't stop. It's not popcorn. Once you pop, you can't stop. You would think it's popcorn. I think this is an easy one. Maybe it's not so easy. Once you pop, you can't stop. That's Pringles potato chips. Question four. The one and a half calorie breath mint. Let me see if anyone's playing along in comments. If anyone's awake, it's four in the morning. My gosh, I've done it again. I've done it again. And I've gone almost four hours. The one and a half calorie breath mint were Tic Tacs. Who was the pitch person for Tic Tacs? A beautiful woman. In the 70s and 80s. Kelly Harmon. Mark Harmon's sister. She was the Tic Tac girl. That's what they referred to her in marketing and advertising. Not me. I know that's considered sexist. The Tic Tac girl. By a lot of people's standards. Now. Oh, I already gave this one away. Might as well just do it. Number five. Question five. There are two. Two. Two mints in one. Certs. Now here's question six. Our final tagline. For this edition of the Nostalgic Pod Blast Taglines game segment. Kid tested, mother approved. It's a breakfast cereal. Kix, K-I-X, Kix cereal. Supposedly the sugar-free cereal that's better for you. I'm sure it was loaded with gluten, right? There you go. We've reached the end of the show. Oh, man, four-hour show. Hey, that's good for the <clears throat> fistful of radio content and the audio content. <clears throat> Listen to it in stages. Pause it, whatever you need to do when I go long like this. I know most people don't have four hours to spare, and you got better things you could do with your time, better things to listen to and watch. I realize that. But uh, I need to have content for certain audio platforms, so that's the reason I do this long. But I try to keep it to three hours. That's my new rule, and I blew it. I went four. But next time on the Nostalgic Pod Blast, this will be live on Friday, October 13th. <clears throat> Excuse me. Friday, October 13th, 2023 at 4 p.m. Eastern, 7 p.m. Pacific, where these people are located. We'll have these guests. Comedian Fritz Coleman, 
He's been on the Adam Carolla show recently and his partner, Louise Palenker. That's his podcast partner. And she's worked with the Cow Sills. The band, the Cow Sills. I can't wait to ask her about that. Um, I love, love, love American style. <laughs> that song, I love that song, which was used for the television show. Um, not the song by the Cow Sills, though. It was, by, uh, it was adapted by Charles Fox. Great musician for television. Anyway, I, I'm all over the place. Um, I can't wait to welcome Fritz Coleman and Louise Palanker. We're going to talk pop culture and talk about their show. And they've had some really cool guests like Craig Kilborn was on their show this week as we're live. Oh, man. Craig Shoemaker, who's a comedian who was once married to Nancy Allen. I've seen him in, co- in, in person at a comedy show uh, at the Punchline Comedy Club here in Atlanta, Georgia, way back in 2008. But he was fantastically funny. And he was good on their show. Media Spotlight, I believe, is what it's called. Um, Want to recommend Curtis. The Retrozest Show is what I call it. It airs on Fistful of Radio weekends and Friday afternoons and some evenings, early evenings, usually around 6 o'clock. But go to Retrozest.com. Not only does he have excellent contests, not only does he have excellent content, guests and fun he also offers t-shirts and other merchandise too just go to retrozest.com to check that out and uh he he had marin jensen on who was a very interesting guest uh she's got businesses going on now she her acting career is in her rearview mirror and has been for some time but um she's dated a member of the eagles uh she talks briefly about that and about her business ventures curtis was very lucky to secure her as a guest that's not a guest you hear every day so good luck to him as always at getting more guests like that and i know he will he just keeps the guests coming so i recommend the retro zest podcast at retrozest.com and check out his facebook page retro zest he does a great job each and every day celebrating people that we care about good job on you curtis lanclo that's the host of the retro zest show um I want to recommend uh, BK on the air, Saturdays, 10 a.m. to noon on WBHF, which is a small radio station, but a heritage radio station. It's been around since 1946 in Cartersville, Georgia. I think it's a 2,000-watt station, but they're on all the platforms, most of them. I don't think they're on Apple, but they're on uh, TuneIn.com. No video for those guys. Those guys don't do video, unfortunately. Sorry about that. I know that sucks, but it's still a good listen. Um, so check them out. Uh, BK on the air. Geek to Me Radio. Now he's on video most of the time. Geek to Me Radio is a live one hour fun hour from St. Louis, Missouri on KTRS Radio, which is a huge station in the St. Louis, Missouri market. Uh, and he's on video on YouTube most Sunday nights or on Facebook Live most Sunday nights. I think he does Twitch as well. But his show airs Sunday nights, the one hour show at 7 o'clock pacific nine o'clock central where he's located in 10 p.m eastern sunday night from 10 to 11 eastern standard time and eastern daylight time depending on when you're listening to this show the nostalgic pod blast check him out a youtuber thrash pondo he does a live show sunday and monday evenings at seven o'clock check out open by chance toys on youtube they're excellent their content is great if you're a collector or if you just want to see collections whether it's toys record albums or comic books you've got to check out this husband and wife team they're awesome david eon and his wife they are great open by chance toys on youtube please check them out and then supermanhomepage.com been around for decades now uh this is run out of australia uh and they're live on youtube monday night at 10 30 eastern 7 30 pacific time does a great they do a great job it, it, two dudes um michael bailey and the webmaster himself i'm having a brain fart on his name oh my gosh i'll look it up this is terrible i know it but i'm, I'm getting punchy let me hang on superman homepage. he's such a nice guy let me look him up the Superman homepage. Just go to supermanhomepage.com for more information. Uh, 
he hosts all sorts of events too, screenings pertaining to Superman on that continent of Australia. Uh, hang on a second. I've got, and, and Michael Bailey is in the Atlanta, Georgia area where I'm located. I can't believe I'm blanking out on his name. I'm Googling Superman homepage webmaster. I know I can hear, hear some of you saying, oh, Steve Eunice. Steve Eunice, oh, my brain failed me on that. His last name is spelled you like you, me, you, you, N-I-S, Steve Eunice. He's a great host, and uh, I love their show, their one-hour show. They'll be back live this Monday night. Uh, check out Dave Sundstrom on YouTube. Huge YouTube channel. He does a lot of great video. Uh, he, has con- he has contests. He has trivia. Um, but look up Dave Sundstrom, S-U-N-S-T-R-O-M on YouTube. Oh, man. And he did a really nice video piece about tops and flair, TV and movie, bubblegum, trading cards. It's a must-see a while back. And then Pat McCormack, Golden Rage of TV on YouTube. And as I said earlier, he just interviewed Lee Purcell, a very rare catch to get uh, someone you don't hear from every day, just like Marin Jensen that uh, Curtis got on the Retrozest podcast recently to celebrate the 45th anniversary of the debut of Battlestar Galactica on September 17th, 1978. And he just had Sarah Rush on, who was in the cast of Battlestar Galactica, another relatively rare guest you don't hear about or see on the convention circuit, at least not that I'm aware of. If she has been doing conventions, forgive me, I don't do, do many conventions anymore. I'm not against them. I just haven't seen any in my area that had people I was that interested in seeing. But uh, anyway, um, good stuff. And remember, the geek shall inherit the earth. Just look at what Bill Gates and Elon Musk are up to. (laughs) And thanks for listening or watching the Nostalgic Pod Blast. I'm Chance Bartell signing off. And I sincerely wish you all the best. Have a great week. Stay safe. And thanks to my friend Hunter Golson for chatting on the show as well. Good night, friends.